evening. Welcome to the Board of Selectmen's meeting for December 7th. Uh, first item up is the consent agenda for the meetings of November 9th, uh, for the minutes of the meeting of November 9th and November 23rd. Is there a motion? Move approval. Second? Second. Discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Next item is specific at 7.30, so we'll move on to appointments to the Arlington uh, Cultural Council, Sherry Green. Sherry with us here this evening? Um, what's the board's pleasure on this? Um, I'm sorry, I got, I'm not connected again. So. Um, Do you want to we, Well, we, what we've done in the past is we asked new appointments to uh, Yep. come before us, but we can approve it and then ask that she come before us uh, at another time. I would time. move that action. Move that. Second? Second. Okay. Any other comments? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Uh, her term would expire on November 30th, 2018. Uh, to the Arlington Tree Committee, John Ellis. Hi. John, how are you? Welcome, sir. Hello. Thanks. Thank you for your willingness to serve. Oh, thank you. At, and handouts. Thanks. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. So, John, tell me, how can a tree boost a home sale price? Come over here, if you would please, sir, to the mic. Well, I've given you three articles. One's from the Wall Street Journal, one's from the Washington Post, and one's from uh, Federal Reserve's Communities and Banking. The Wall Street Journal article talks about how, uh, on average, a price of a home goes up by $7,000 with a public street tree in front of the home. Um, really, seven thousand. On average, uh, it's a, a, a wide study of fifty thousand homes in Portland, Oregon. Um, second thing to point out is that uh, there was a Washington Post on a major study that demonstrated that trees actually um, controlling for age, controlling for income, controlling for a lot of factors, uh, improve the health uh, of the people living near the trees. And the um, third item talks about how trees actually improve. Uh, turnover and income for local businesses. And I just wanted to, to, to mention that 2014, the town removed 174 trees and planted 167. Um, so actually we're sort of heading in the wrong direction because each year there are less trees in town than there were before. And that number actually underestimates it a little bit because obviously the big trees are coming down and little trees are being put up. So I would encourage the board to uh, consider the economic uh, health and uh, income benefits of trees and uh, in future budgets uh, take accounting for the fact uh, that there are many benefits beyond having a nice tree in, in front of your house that uh, uh, pay dividends to the town for years to come. And so I think you're interested in trees and why else are you looking forward to serve on this committee, sir? Uh, well, I, I, I lived in Arlington since 1999. Uh, I have two kids in Hardy School. Uh, own a business, uh, been in Arlington Center for 15 years, um, so I'm um, connected with the community and like to play a greater role in the town. Thank you very much. Motion? I, I move approval. I don't, I don't have any questions after hearing all that. Second? Second. Any more grilling? No. no. Grilling's on. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much for your willingness Thanks. to serve. Thank you. And the expertise you obviously bring. <laughs> Um, so uh, let's do one more item and then uh, I tingle with excitement. I see Chairman Greeley has arrived. Uh, we'll get to that in a moment. This is under licenses and permits, a request from Monotomy Grill and Tavern for a late night event. Mr. Lyons. Yes. Is my brother whispering something to you over there? No, he shook his head. I, he didn't say anything. All right, go ahead. Billy, go ahead, tell us what you're. Uh, well, this is just um, for New Year's Eve. If I could have the extended hour, um, like last year, keep these keep the celebration in Arlington. Yep, move approval. Second. Second. Right. And when is last call, Bill? Twelve thirty. Okay. Yep. You know, and we'll be serving food right up. You know. Right up till the end. Okay. Any any discussion? Okay, Ms. Mahan. Um, just I have a few. Yeah. Quick questions that um, I think I already know the answer to, but yep. I just, I'm just curious. Um, 
Do you have a policy, when I used to work back in the day, I'm 53, so back in my te yep. late teens, early 20s, regarding um, employees in uniform uh, consumption of alcohol and or um, food uh, when they're in the uniform on the floor on duty or? Okay, so this is just monotony. Right, no, I'm just curious. Um, if you've worked a shift, you can't have a drink. That includes the, me. Mm -hmm. But if I choose to go to monotony on my day off, mm -hmm. I can have a drink with my dinner. So, I mean, okay. you know, every company's different. It mm -hmm. works for us. Yeah. You know, it kind of keeps, eliminates the gray area. Um, if you're a server and you get off, you can eat in uniform. Mm -hmm. And we discount the food and all that. So it's, it's more about the alcohol. And then um, just with the extended, extended hours, um, do you have any sort of a policy that, um, if somebody orders two drinks regarding any food consumption or purchase or? Well, we follow the, you know, the town. If you have that second drink, we suggest food. And then the third drink, they have to have food. So, you know, that was, that's an adjustment when a guest comes from out of town because they look at you like you're crazy. But mm -hmm. if you greet them and let them know when they walk in, it's really not an issue. It's, you know, um, at least for us, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and like I mentioned last time, I'm fortunate at Monotomy, everybody eats and drinks. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're 60% food sales, so Excellent. I'm proud of that. Thank so. you. Uh, anybody else? Who, did you, who made the motion, Ms. Mahan? Mm -hmm. Yes. No. no, no it is. I said move yeah. approval. And seconded by Mr. Dunn. Was, by, so. I seconded oh. it, yes. Kevin. Okay. But either, in any event, it was moved and seconded. So. so, no matter who moved this thing, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now we have a 7.30 p.m. discussion and vote on property tax classification. Should we do it right now or wait five minutes? Oh, uh, we still have five minutes? Yeah, sorry. Well, they're all here. Let's go. Right? Who's speaking? The chair? Oh, do I have to wait? I, I think it's fine. We're being yeah. broadcast in ECMI. Unless right. there's okay, cool. Is the chair speaking or Mr. Tierney? Who's up? Oh, God. <laughs> hey, Nick, pay attention. It's an honor to welcome Mr. Robert Spray Greeley, chairman of the Board of Sele Assessors. Yes, sir. I think the last time I stood here in this position, you were the youngest person on this board. <laughs> 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 and your memory was much, much better versus what I just heard. Thank you so much. Next. It's, it's, <laughs> it's nice to be here, not having been here in five years. Um, as you know, uh, we're here tonight to give uh, all of you board members information so that you can then make a decision concerning the classification of uh, real estate and the potential tax rate here in the town. Uh, before I turn this over, um, I'd like to make sure that we thank our staff downstairs uh, for all of their help. Phil Kniff, Ellen Kelly, uh, Mary McMakin, uh, and especially our Director of Assessments, uh, who we will turn this over to very shortly, Paul Tierney. Uh, in my opinion, for someone who's been around here about 30 odd years, I happen to think that this may be the best recertification that this town has had in 30 odd years. So without any further ado, I'd but like to I introduce you all to Paul Tierney. So the prior 30 years, who was in charge of that recertification that wasn't done as well as this year's? Your older brother. I was just curious, okay. <laughs> I'm sure it, your guidance, but he's been, you've been here every year, brother, uh, on this, but uh, I think what you mean is this is the first time you have been chair of assessors and I've been chair of the Board of Select. Very right? good. <laughs> and I don't know whether we should publicly place a bet on who gets the most votes in the spring, since we're both on the ballot. Ooh, I'll go a hundy. Uh, one would have to decide to run first. Before I just gave you a great, great opportunity for an announcement. <laughs> As usual, you missed the pass. We'll see. Paul Tierney. Thank you, Chairman. Are um, you sorry he's running in the spring, Paul? I actually, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Smart. Love having them there. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Uh, I would like to also thank my staff, um, Phil Kniff, Ellen Kelly, Mayor McMakin. They do a lot of work behind the scenes that no one sees, and it's everything is made possible by all the work that they do. 
So now we turn your attention to the pamphlet that we have uh, that just shows out the <coughs> levy, the tax levy that we need to raise this year for the town to run. Uh, to calculate, the sick, we take last year's levy, add the uh, school and debt exclusion, water and sewer debt, and the maximum to be raised is 109 million. <coughs> so then we go down to the, to calculate the tax rate, take the amount to be raised, divide it by the total taxable assessed value, multiply it by 1,000, which gives us a tax rate of 1,280. And the excess levy is 28,633. We go to the next page, just breaks down uh, how the, the amount that these, the residential, as you can see, takes up 93% of our property, close to 94. So we have a minimum residential factor of 96%. We turn to the next page, just gives us the uh, mesh general law that we are allowed to classify property up to 150%. We can shift the commercial, industrial, personal property. And if we do that, you'll see all the calculations on the next page. If we keep it at 100%, we will tax commercial and real estate at 1280, which we think is the right way to do it. If you go down that page, you can see all the calculations if we do uh, offer a shift. Excuse me. The next page is just the tax rates for all the years prior. Pretty straightforward. Next page is the LA-4, which lists out all the parcels and their values separately. Gives us the real estate count at the bottom, exempt uh, personal property, the amount of tax, the total real estate tax. Uh, go on to the next page. That shows our value by classes from the previous year, uh, the number of, of abatements we had, as long as the, along with their values. Uh, we take those adjustments. We go on to the next page. It shows a lot of our, our adjustments plus our growth for the year. As you can see at the bottom right-hand corner, our growth for the year was 1,337,666. Following page, we have uh, assessed values for uh, FY16 and for 15. As you can see, the comparisons in the middle 16 versus 15, uh, the values went up quite a bit this year. For residential, it was 9.35%, for commercial, 14.12%, industrial properties, 8.91%, and the total real estate went up 9.56%. The following page breaks down the taxes um, by, as you can see, the levy, 2.5%, uh, growth, water and sewer, and the school debt adds up to 1280. Um, and we take, I don't know if we break it all down, it's just basically what it says in the previous few pages. Uh, I already told you the growth for this year. The average assessed single family uh, value is $585,360. Uh, the average taxes for a single family home this year, $7,493. On the final page, it's just a little graph to show some neighboring communities, what their taxes are compared to Arlington. And the Board of Assessors recommends a single tax rate of twelve eighty for the year. This is the debt shift conversation always like. <laughs> Just reminding as a good vice chair does. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, questions in the board? Comments? Mr. Dunn. Uh, so one of the things I guess that I, I we know uh, there's a lot of uh, growth this year, especially as compared uh, to what we thought there was going to be, you know, sitting here a year ago. Uh, do you have any thoughts or perhaps the town manager wants to share, like, you know, thoughts about growth uh, th this past year and what that means going forward? Well, a lot, of, uh, a lot of the growth is coming from teardowns and rebuilding homes, uh, the condominiums that are converted into 
I mean, excuse me, the two and three families that are being converted. Um, got a lot of personal property growth from some of the new buildings in town. So that, in, uh, so that I can see that going forward. Is it going to be the same every year? That's very tough to project. I, I would simply add to that that Paul and I talk about this. Uh, we track a 10-year retrospective new growth average. Uh, the two years prior to this fiscal year is, did have some larger new growth figures, but they included the Sims development and the Brigham's development. So when we do our averages, we net those out because those aren't, uh, you know, the, the developments of that scope aren't going to happen year over year. Uh, and we, we are trying to, as part of the long-range planning committee, decide whether or not our projected new growth on a go-forward basis is, is appropriate. And it, it, it is tough. You know, where, where we hedge is if the economy keeps moving and people keep tearing down homes and rebuilding them, I think new growth might tip up. If it doesn't, you know, that could be a different story. Okay. Sir. Yeah, Mr. Carroll. Um, well, firstly, I'd like to move to uh, support the recommendation of the Board of Assessors. Okay. Second. Um, and um, just to, to speak to this, I think we have this conversation each year. I mean, the, the town of Arlington, <clears throat> we only have about 6% of the, of the, um, the um, valuation is uh, built on commercial property. You know, the vast majority of it is residential property. And... Um, <clears throat> The result of that is that, you know, the, the purpose of this hearing is to decide whether or not we're going to uh, implement classification and a different rate of tax for those who are not familiar with the hearing, different rate of taxation for commercial property versus residential. But the, the numbers are so disproportionate that I think that traditionally for many years, I guess forever really, this board has declined to, um, to have a differential rate um, and, and that's why I make the motion to support support that policy. Um, we know at the master planning uh, process, we, we stressed the need to build up the commercial base. We always stress that we've invested in um, economic development planning in town. Um, <clears throat> if you just, you know, look at one, two, three, four, five, on, um, I think it's the fifth page here, there's a comparison here uh, based on 100%, which means taxing both commercial and residential at 1280 per thousand, um, or going all the way to 150%, so taxing uh, commercial property at 50% greater. Um, <clears throat> if we went all the way, just to give a sense of the magnitude, commercial property would see $3,200 per $500,000 increase in their taxes, um, while residents would only see $163 drop per 400,000. I do wish that was the same unit, those are the same units there. I think it would be okay. easier to compare, but it, it still draws the point that um, it would be minimal savings and potential, you know, real detriment to our um, commercial uh, properties. So um, I, I think it's sound that we continue the policy that we have. I also just wanted to note that um, this is the third year in a row that the, the actual tax rate is dropping. Now that's offset by the greater valuations. It looks like you know residential um, valuation is increasing by nine and a third percent, which which kind of demonstrates the, the continuing strong market in, in in this town, which we saw through the recession and we see onwards. So um, I think those are a few things that I draw out of this. I really appreciate the work and the analysis, and I think the only comment I would make is that it, it would be great if those units were the. The same. I'm not sure if there's a, a rationale for doing per 500 and per 400 on the, the comparison. No, it's just, just tradition. Like <laughs> mm. Yeah. So, but thank you very much for all of the work, you and the board. I would just add to that, and I don't mean this as a negative, a great deal of our commercial businesses are what we call a mom and pop shop. I mean, That's it's, right. Uh, Absolutely. Um, you know, they're working hard on it. Second. Yeah, Mr. Byrne. Um, thank you very much. Well, what, you know, percentage, I believe I, when I've asked in the past it was around 10% that you'd consider going to a split rate. Is that about what you'd, you know, probably the board would still look at? Um, or to split the commercial? Yeah. It's at what point would it make sense, do you think, um, when it comes down to a, well, if you know, went, we're looking at 6% now? If, yeah, if you, tr if you went 10%, uh, residential home would only save $32 mm. in commercial 
would be six hundred and forty dollar okay. increase. So it's pretty significant. That's the best example, Steve. We took Bobby, you gotta go to the mic, sorry. The millions listening in at home, <laughs> buddy. If we took the city of Cambridge, mm -hmm. I think the split is sixty eight thirty two off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. So they not only have the classification where they're shifting that amount on and they can go to one point seven five if I'm not mistaken, whereas there's us being at one fifty. Hmm. Number one. Number two, they then, because they are non-owner occupied properties, then get into a residential exemption. If you own a $425,000 condo in the city of Cambridge or a house, but you won't find one that's assessed that low, okay, your total tax bill isn't $1,900. You're given about $1,800 a year off on a residential exemption plus the split. Mm -hmm. Part of the problem here in Arlington, and we have no control over it because of statutes, mm -hmm. we have more in assessed value for apartments than we do in all commercial and industrial property combined. But when two and a half passed and started in 1983, BOMAR, which is the Building Owners Management Association, they were smart enough after the decision out of Lincoln, they had it legislated that apartment buildings are considered residential properties for taxation. At one point in time, um, apartment buildings were taxed pre two and a half at 25 percent, right off the top. Today, the average statewide isn't 11 or 12 percent. Okay, thanks. And again, outside of Mass Ave, we don't have anything commercially we could expand. Gotcha. What? What did one? Can, oh, can I make a point? Mr. Chaplin. Uh, just to, to Mr. Burns' uh, point, I, I recall collaborating uh, with uh, Chair Greeley uh, several years ago on an analysis like you're referencing, and uh, Mr. Greeley mentioned triple it. So we're at 6%. I, I, I recall our analysis falling between 15 and 20% is where okay. it starts to make sense to consider shifting. If you're at 32%, then you're, yeah. it's a lot easier to think about. But until you get to that number, the pain is too great on so, one side. Gotcha. Thank you. Ms. Lamb? I just also want to point out the other two members of the Board of Assessors is also with us, Kevin Feely and Mary Wynn Stanley O'Connor. And Mr. Gilligan, uh, Treasurer, did you wish to speak on this at all? No? I'm good with it, Chair. All right. Uh, so uh, any, anything else from the Board? Uh, I'm going to guess Mr. Jameson would like to speak on this issue. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. Greeley. Um, I'm Gordon Jamison. I'm co-chair of the Physical Resource Task Group, and uh, we've taken an interest in this over the past years. And for those at home, this is one of the, really one of the most important meetings, um, hearings that this happens in front of the Board of Selectmen, with all due respect for everything else you do in the year. And it happens every year at this time. It's always good to understand how your tax rate is set. Um, first off, I want to thank the, uh, the assessor, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> and the board for um, uh, cooperating very kindly. It took time because of some of the turmoil over the last couple years in the office to provide us with some information. We were interested in looking at commercial assessments um, and that, that was very helpful for us. And uh, I also wanted to commend them on the decision to use an external Patriot properties for, for the commercial reassessment process uh, this year versus doing it in, in staff to help secure that the commercial properties are properly assessed. Um, yeah, to, to uh, follow on Mr. Chairman Greeley, uh, well, this Chairman Greeley. <laughs> Did you call him honorable? No, you're the honorable because uh, you're chairing. <laughs> he, he's just chairman right now. <laughs> Downstairs, he's the honorable, and you're just chairman. <laughs> um, on, on, on the deal that the, uh, with the, all due respect to our large apartments have in that they get, they get, um, assessed as a commercial property, but taxed as a, real, as a residential property. Such a deal if we could all have that. Um, uh, I th thank uh, Mr. Curro for bringing up the, the concept of split rate, which um, we have brought up over the years. And uh, one member of the board a, couple year, a number of years ago thought about maybe we could ease into that. You know, the, the discussion with all due respect is usually based upon what Mr. Curro brought up, which is the, the full, the full whole, whole nine yards what happens when you go to 150 but we could go to five percent you know um but we're gonna we're not gonna push that right now or five or ten percent uh split uh, we want to look at what the commercial assessments have done over this this past year um 
obviously the growth is doing well the tax rate is down um, I, I would comment also that uh, echo the comment about new growth of mr. Dunn um, is it 450 we scheduled in the uh, budget this year yeah and that's been something that this that, that our group is as uh, nudge the the manager and his uh, and Andrew in here in and, and previous people um, and I guess the last question sort of uh, thinking forward in that is um, if we keep that up uh, how do we how does that help the structural deficit perhaps a question directed if I may to Mr. Uh, Chapdelaine so whenever new growth um, so to, to set the stage as Gordon uh, alluded to and Mr. Dunn alluded to earlier in the long-range projections, we, uh, we project $450,000 in new growth per year. The 10-year retrospective average today with that new $1.3 million figure, if you net out Sims and Brigham's, is about $733,000. That's what I would guess, yeah. So uh, last year, it was $656,000, so it's, it is inching up. Um, in a year like this, when you budget $450,000 and then you get $1.3 million, you have a nearly $900,000 increase this year and every year going forward. So the base is increased by 900, so you collect that 900 every year going forward as compared right. to what you project. So I guess to try to be succinct, I would say it has a pretty tremendous impact on the town's long-term uh, financial viability. And, it, and if, it, if it continued to happen year over year, it would reduce the structural deficit by that requisite amount. Now, I get nudgy about pushing it too far oh, I understand because completely. come this time of year as we're trying to set the tax rate if you've pushed your projection too far and budgeted too high and you fall short you're stuck and you have, you're, you have a budget out of balance you have to call a special town meeting to cut a budget somewhere and that's a situation no city or town wants to be in so I, I don't say that to oppose considerations of you know a, a responsible increase but I, I think that's there's also a good reason to be conservative in in this particular projection. No, no, and we 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 can agree to have a little a little arm wrestle occasionally there, and uh, which I think is appropriate as part of the process, which we have a very open process here in town. Um, the last thing I would comment on that is um, some people don't understand the choice between development, and um, I think many people, some people are members of town meeting think you can say no to development and all will be good. But in reality, if you say no to development, you're saying yes to an override. So that's, 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 that's the choice. The balance is between. So if we can get a sufficient amount of development, as Mr. Chapdelaine alluded to, we can help keep our curve moving forward as far as when, when we have to then next consider a new revenue. Um, so uh, this, this is a wonderful news as far as that goes. And I thank the, uh, the board and the the assessor for their uh, important input into this process. Thanks. Thank you, Gordon. Anybody else wishing to comment on the tax rate? Um, yes, Ms. Mahan. Just very briefly, um, I certainly um, applaud Mr. Jameson's remarks um, in terms of trying to increase and perhaps offsetting an override, but I also understand um, we're sort of confined with the, within the boundaries of what land we can build in Arlington, um, that we can go out and get new businesses, but I am of the understanding that the redevelopment board is sort of um, <coughs> per last year's town meeting vote looking at the zoning bylaws in terms of the land we have what is commercial um, and perhaps finding a way that we can ent entice some new businesses here am I correct it's that? absolutely true okay so just to mr. Jamison's point a it's very difficult because because of the topography of um, or geography of Arlington, we're kind of stuck in terms of trying to find new businesses. But Mr. Chapdelaine, I don't know. I don't want to interrupt you. That's I fine. It. Uh, I, I feel it isn't. Uh, everything you're saying is right on. The ARB and the Master Plan Implementation Committee are working on implementing some first steps in trying to incentivize further development. But I, that's what brought to my mind. I, I don't want anybody watching to think that because there's residential new growth that it's a free ride. Because as residential new growth occurs, it's more than likely that that is improving or upgrading or expanding residential space and thereby potentially welcoming new families, which increase our student population, as we're discussing with the school enrollment task force. So when you're dealing with an expanding school enrollment, you're, you're bringing in new tax dollars and probably incurring a higher degree of cost in that amount. So incentivizing uh, economic development or commercial development isn't isn't free either, but is certainly less cost intense than residential development. So uh, I'm not putting a value judgment on any of that, but I, I think it would be, it's important to state that 
as new growth occurs, the type of new growth that it is can also have a counterbalance on the expense side of the ledger. Anybody else? You know, uh, Marie and I have been doing some research um, for the uh, Selectman's Handbook, and in 1868, the tax rate was $15.50 per thousand. What a fantastic job our assessors have done. <laughs> now, try and find a house in 1868 worth $1,000, right? I mean, there were, what, $100 or 200 maybe at that time. So, on the motion regarding uh, classification, keeping at one, did I say that right? Uh, all the, uh, on the motion by Mr. Kiro, right? Seconded by Mr. Dunn. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, oh, further speech? Order of business. You got, I need to have the LA-5 signed by the board. Uh, oh, oh, right, 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 right. <laughs> Thank you. While we're doing that, Sherry, please uh, come on up if you wouldn't mind, Sherry, and we'll, we'll sign that. Uh, Sherry, I am pleased to report that unanimously <laughs> this board has appointed you to the Arlington Cultural Council. Uh, thank, you. thank you for coming back, and <laughs> sorry we messed that up last meeting. Why did we unanimously elect you to the Arlington Cultural Council? Yes, why did you? <laughs> <laughs> but you obviously have an interest in Yes. Uh, so would you like me to say something about that? Yeah, please, sure, if you would. Um, yes, I've, I have a passion about the arts. I grew up with a mother who was an artist, and I've went to college and have a degree in art and anthropology and then a master's degree in social work. But even in my current practice as a life coach, I use the arts, um, including playback theater, writing, drawing, and have always done that. I'm very involved in singing with the Mr. Corral is one of my loves. And I take classes with True Story Theater and I usher at several. I usher at Central Square Theater and New Rep and um, enjoy music, visual arts, performing arts, and would just love the opportunity to see that grow and flourish in Arlington and to be part of that. Well, thank you very much for your interest and your willingness to serve. Ms. Mahan. I just want to say, great to see you again, Sherry. I sort of cut my teeth way back in the day um, with <laughs> yeah. Sherry when we were Brackett School Moms. Right. Um, right. Besides right. keeping Brackett and Pierce open, which was my foray yeah. into yeah, politics. Um, one of the things, um, when I was PTO president for a crazy five years, um, Sherry was active, um, A, in the turnaround in terms of fundraising, um, making the June Fair and other things, you know, so we would have a f five high five figure budget, but also with the cultural enrichment programs and um, off and on on the PTO board and, and different subcommittees. Um, and it's amazing, I, th I think she and others um, who I was lucky enough to work with really laid the roots for the very active PTO um, activities that go on up at Brackett. So um, I'm thrilled to see her. I just want to let everyone know I've known her forever <laughs> since my kids were babies. And I'm thrilled I'm going to get to see you in this extra capacity. And I know you're going to do a fantastic job. So well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank, you very much. thank you very much, Sherry. So do I need your signs? I know I have to come to be sworn in during the day tomorrow. The town clerk's office. Yeah. Thank you. I'm dying. Yeah. I mean, I'm hot. hot. Can that one up? Can we open the... Uh... Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> it is hot, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> We're supposed to be in the hot seat. What'd you have to run for to get that? <laughs> All right, uh, friends. So the next item on the agenda is a liquor license uh, violation hearing, uh, potential chapter 138, section 69 violation with the uh, Common Ground restaurant. So the procedure which we're gonna follow here is first we're gonna hear from our uh, town council, uh, then we're gonna hear from um, Mr. O'Gwin and also his, his council, then there will be uh, questions by, from any member of the board uh, to either either the councils or, or the owner, any comments? Then we'll ask uh, town council if he has a, a recommended motion and see whether any member is willing to uh, make that motion. So, that said, Mr. Hine, 
Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Madam Vice Chairman, um, members of the board. I want to start out for a moment by going through the posture that we find ourselves in, the basis for the evidence in this particular hearing. So bear with me for a few moments before we get into the facts of the case before you. The first thing I want to note is that what we're really here to decide tonight is whether or not common ground served alcohol to a visibly intoxicated person um, on their premises. More specifically, to find a violation in this instance, there must be sufficient evidence that a reasonable person serv serving alcohol knew or should have known that a customer was intoxicated prior to over serving them. Uh, though the ABCC conducted a joint investigation with our police department, they did not pursue process of their own in advance of the Board of Selectmen and the local, as the local licensing authority. Accordingly, uh, what we decide here will be the only substantive hearing there will be on this unless uh, there is a decision that is appealed by the license holder to the ABCC. In terms of the sources of evidence, one of the things that I want to note uh, at the outset is unfortunately Inspector Foley, who is the chief person responsible for the investigation from APD, is not available tonight. He's not going to be available anytime soon to my knowledge. Um, so we all just have to deal with that. And unfortunately, Chief Ryan is um, out of town on business. So um, all the facts that I'm going to present to you are based upon police departments, reports, the ABC and uh, police department joint investigation in terms of interview notes that they took surveillance video at Common Ground, uh, or other types of evidence such as medical evidence provided to the police department by the district attorney's office, as well as some additional inquiries conducted by the police department in my office uh, to directly to uh, uh, Mr. Oguin and through counsel uh, Mr. Leone here. Uh, so the overwhelming majority of these facts are not in dispute, and so for the purposes of both efficiency and trying to respect the privacy of what a somewhat sensitive situation is for the deceased and the family. Um, we don't need to examine the direct evidence itself as these, again, facts are not in dispute. Um, the relevant facts that I'll run down, uh, you have these facts, have been provided to you in advance, so I'll just provide a more summarized, truncated version <coughs> of that unless the board uh, wants to go over all the individual <coughs> facts. Um, in summary, the gentleman, Mr. James McLaughlin, was in a fatal car accident at approximately 1.28 on January 1st of this year. At the time of his death, his blood alcohol content was over twice the legal limit. He just left common ground before the accident where he'd been served both food and alcohol. Mr. McLaughlin had been eating and drinking at common ground at various times throughout the day, coming and going uh, at several junctures, uh, eating and drinking, and at times with off-duty common ground employees. It's important to note that none of the bartenders, staff, or other witnesses indicated to investigators that Mr. McLaughlin appeared drunk to them, nor did surveillance video provide a sufficient basis for such a determination alone. I also have to pause here to note that blood alcohol content by law is not sufficient in and of itself to prove a case of over-service, a Section 69 violation. Nonetheless, on the basis of all the direct and circumstantial evidence, this office and the police chief believe a hearing is appropriate. It's beyond dispute that Mr. McLaughlin was intoxicated, <coughs> that he was served alcohol, although with food, at common ground throughout the day in question, and that during his last visit, he'd been there for several hours before leaving, and that during his last visit, um, he had alcohol before getting an accident into a car accident which, for which we have no other plausible ex, uh, explanation than driving under the influence. Further, while all common ground employees insist that they did not know he was intoxicated, Mr. McLaughlin's close relationship with employees and other circumstantial evidence, at the very least, raised the question uh, in earnest of whether they should have reasonably known he was intoxicated. Thus, while this is a close case with many unresolved questions, and I must also recognize that Common Ground has been extraordinarily cooperative throughout all stages of the investigation and examination of this matter, I respectfully submit that some modification or suspension is appropriate here. I understand that Common Ground shares many concerns, though does not ultimately agree with the end analysis uh, myself and the police chief uh, present to you. So at this point, um, I would offer uh, Common Ground the opportunity to speak on their own behalf in response to these allegations. Um, and then I'd be happy to answer any questions the board may have for me, or obviously Mr. Leone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, John Leone, I'm here with um, Robert O'Gwin, the owner of Common Ground. <clears throat> Go through a few points of my own. To start off with, I want to 
I'll start off by stating that Common Ground unequivocally denies that it is in violation of Mass General Law Chapter 138, Section 69, and 204 CMR 2.052, and that it is in agreement with the Alcohol Beverage Control Commission's determination to that effect. Further, it denies any liability or cul culpability in Mr. McLaughlin's unfortunate accident. That being said, Common Ground is concerned about the issue of drunk driving, as all of you are and as I am. Common Ground has a strict alcohol service policy, which I have provided to you just now, and all of its employees have been trained on a weekly basis in alcohol service and in spotting um, intoxicated patrons. In the instant matter, Mr. McLaughlin was served four to five drinks over a 10-hour period, two in the afternoon to midnight. And in that time, he had at least one meal and snacks at diff different times and that he had left the restaurant for several hours during that time, leaving and coming back at least three to four times. In his last time there, he was served one beer in an hour and a half time that he was there, one Guinness. As you know, Guinness has a lower alcohol content than other beers. Common Ground employees and its general manager had chatted with Mr. McLaughlin throughout the evening and as midnight approached, as we were, they were wishing everyone a happy new year, and they were aware of no visible signs of intoxication from Mr. McLaughlin. In regard to the functioning of Common Ground, all alcoholic drinks are served from the main bar. There is no service bar. There's no opportunity for a uh, server to get a drink somewhere else in the restaurant and slip it to a customer unbeknownst to the main bartenders who make all the drinks. And in fact, 70% of Common Ground's revenue is from food and 30% is from alcohol, so it's not a, really, one could say not a huge bar room. And since this occurred, Common Ground on its own, on its own volition has eliminated its employees' so-called shift drinks, and their employees are no longer allowed to remain at the bar, you know, they never were allowed to remain at the bar in their uniform and to drink. If they want to stay at Common Ground and have food or drinks, they have to leave, change out of their uniforms and come back in civilian clothing. <clears throat> this is a relatively new business in town, about a year and a half, without any violations, in fact, without any violations of alcohol policy at all. And in fact, it has voluntarily on at least three, perhaps four occasions, called the Arlington Police Department to report um, intoxicated and rowdy individuals who unsuccessfully had sought to be served in their bar room. People have come from other places who they know are intoxicated and they have called the police to report these people, have them removed, etc. Again, with all of that being said, Common Ground is willing to work with the town to enforce strict alcohol service compliance. Even though the four factors that Mr. Heim mentioned in the last page of his memo to you can all be construed in the negative, they still want to do the right thing by the town of Arlington and by their license and take this matter for its seriousness that it should deserve. If you have any questions, we'd be glad to answer them. Okay. Thank you. Uh, questions from members of the board. Start with Mr. Dunn. Uh, so the, the alcohol policy that you, that you gave us, uh, how long is that one? Has it been since inception of the company, or is it recent? Yes. Or? Since the inception of the company, I had Mr. O'Gwin. He had one in his Br Brookline restaurant, which also has never had any violations, I might state. He had one there. We refined it to um, reflect Arlington's particular service policies. Thank you. That's it. Uh, I guess, yeah, I, just one more. Um, probably for uh, council. Uh, did you, so in all of this, uh, did you come out with, like have I, after assessing all the facts and thinking about everything and talking to all the people you did, did you come up with a set of an outcome that you think is the appropriate one, knowing our town policies? Uh, yes, Mr. Dunn. I, I think I'd be happy to discuss my recommendation uh, following uh, the questions from uh, the board members. Okay. If that's if that's okay. I mean, if yeah. Yep. Yeah, I'd rather wait. Sounds good. That's okay. All right, Mr. Carroll, you want to go next? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, following on to, to my colleague's question, that the policy regarding um, employees drinking in uniform. How, how old is that policy? They've never been allowed to drink in uniform. They've never been allowed no. to drink in uniform. On, on the day in question, um, how many bartenders actually served Mr. McLaughlin? It was throughout the day. He came in periodically 
for ten areas, and I think it was about three bartenders. It was separate bartenders. Does the evidence back that up? Yeah. So, uh, Mr. Kiro, there were <coughs> at least uh, two separate sets of bartenders. Two separate sets of bartenders. Okay. And um, how uh, how crowded was the establishment at the time of the, la the, the last uh, around midnight? Wasn't crowded at all. The last service was not crowded at all. Okay. And I just, is this time for comment or, or are you just yeah, looking for questions at this point? Like, sure. um, I, I'm eager to hear what, what council's recommendation is. I, I just want to stress that I, I think that we all are pretty um, grieved by this. Um, there's a death that, 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 that occurred on this evening after the circumstances. I know we may be in dispute as to what the direct, um, the direct causes were, but there does seem to be at least uh, a dotted line, if not a, a direct line. And um, this is why we're so strict as a board on, on these violations, um, because every violation is a serious potential, a potential um, um, death um, or, or tragedy waiting to happen. Um, you know, and I think that for myself, I mean, I'm scrutinizing this particularly closely because we've certainly, we've broken some previous precedents for this establishment, and I think that we all came together as a board to, to do this, you know, open mm -hmm. air windows and, and alcohol served out on the public, um, the public sidewalk. Uh, we, 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 um, allow, we've allowed outdoor seating before, but this is the first time with, with uh, alcohol in the public space. So um, I'll be interested to hear my other colleagues' questions and uh, what uh, council has as a recommendation for us, but I just wanted to, to stress why the board is so, um, or I, for one, am so aggrieved by, 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 by the incident. Yeah, he, Mr. O'Quinn appreciates that and he appreciates what the board has done, which is why we've been working with Mr. Council yeah. to come to a resolution of this matter, because it is taken very seriously. Yeah. Thank you. Mrs. Mahan. Okay. Um, just a quick little preamble has n nothing really to do with anything with the exception of um, for about 20 years I worked for an agency that was a successful bidder with the city of Boston for MoCal, Mayor of Consumer Office Affairs and Licensing and also over at ABCC. I was there as a court reporter only. I haven't had any contact with them in probably 15, 20 years. Um, so I just wanted, I was never mm -hmm. received any compensation from um, the city of Boston or the Commonwealth. It was always through the agency. I was 1099 employee. Um, secondly, I'm assuming everybody's comfortable with, um, including the gentleman at the microphone, with Inspector Foley not being able to make it tonight. Yeah. Yes. That's a yes. Um, and I'm just going by what's been um, presented to us. Um, I had really overview procedural questions with the chairman and Mrs. Kropelka around scheduling, and I've had um, at the chair's suggestion to all of us. Uh, pretty substantive conversation or two with Attorney Heim as well as with the town manager. Um, first off, I want to extend our condolences, um, Mr. Carroll and all of us, um, to the gentleman's family who unfortunately lost his life. Um, that's really at the forefront um, in terms of what I'm thinking at. I have a sense that um, I know most recently we've had um, tips violations and had to sort of set a criteria for that. Um, for me, this is a more serious issue. I understand the civil side and, and the statement preamble you had to make at the beginning, but um, you know, with the tips violations, nobody was served, nobody drove, nobody died, and nobody was .19, I think it was. There's a couple of contradictions in, in the report, the way that I'm reading it, that I have here before us, but I just wanted to start off, um, it, it's, it, in the report, that we got from the police department, it says that um, on three separate occasions, according to the video, that this gentleman was seen socializing and drinking with employees. Are you disputing that? Um, at least twice, I think. Only two times, I think, right? It was at the end of the night. Um, okay, I'll, I'm not wearing a seatbelt at this point. It says in here three times. And what, what that says to me, it seems like this is a new policy, because if this policy was in effect, then no, those employees should not have been drinking. When no, when they're off duty, they're allowed to socialize with individuals in the town. That's, that's the, on their own time. There were two employees who 
came back to the restaurant after their shifts had ended that were with him at the end of the night. One was his daughter and one was the other woman involved in the accident. Can I'm, Madam, I'm, Madam Vice Chair, may, may I speak to that? It said they include, concluded their shifts, but what I got from the report was that, um, at least for the first three, they did not go home or go anywhere else, change out of their uniform and engage. Am I incorrect? If I may, uh, it's, it's, my, it's my understanding of events, and I've viewed all the videotape personally, that uh, at least two of the occasions uh, were uh, staff members who came off their shift. Um, they may not have been in uniform, but they came off their shift and did, in fact, consume beverages with Mr. McLaughlin on the premises. I don't, I don't think that's in dispute, that they were on their shift, but they didn't leave and go home. They drank with Mr. McLaughlin there. One was... But not in uniform. But not in uniform. That's correct. And then I believe mm -hmm. the third time, uh, Mr. McLaughlin came back with one of the same employees who he had been drinking with previously that night. I'm not, uh, to be clear, there's not evidence that these employees were on their shift while they were drinking. They came off their shift mm -hmm. and were off duty and were drinking with Mr. McLaughlin. Not in uniform, though. And that, I, I agree, Correct. not yeah. in uniform, yes. Okay, kind of, just my understanding, for, just from um, mm -hmm. gathering some information that, you know, in my opinion, I think you need to have and haven't had, my opinion, a clear-cut policy on what I call the in-uniform protocol um, in terms of, I've worked as a youngster, teenager, 20s, plus I'm familiar with the restaurant business from so many people that have tried and failed and tried and successful. And it's a pretty uniform rule that a, and especially for a business like the Common Ground, um, where you've done it in Alston, Brighton, somewhere else. So I consider it more on the higher end, um, as well as Mr. Carroll's remarks that we've really tried to work with you um, to, to give you some sort of leeway, and I guess I'm looking at from you, back from you, but um, is it your policy now that in terms of whether you come off, if you're on a shift that day and you finish your shift, you cannot sit down and order a drink and socialize with anybody, another employee? Or, I mean, what's your policy on that? I, I heard a if you change previously your uniform, stated one. If you hmm? change your uni out of uniform, you're allowed to socialize and have a drink. You're a regular uh, uh, person out there, a customer. You're, I mean, I can't dictate to you where you can and cannot go once you're off your duties. Um, I don't allow you while you're on your shift or while you're uni um, coming around uniform to have a drink. You're not allowed to. But if you go and you change, and apparently that young lady had a dress on and stuff, so she wasn't wearing a dress while she was being a waitress. Uh, she went and changed and came back and had a drink with him. Okay. I would just, I, I'm, I'm, I've been told other things, I, I and I'm, I'm kind of getting may confused I, I, here. I think there's a minor dispute here, and I don't want to make too much of it because I don't think it's absolutely central to this case. Mm -hmm. But from the video surveillance, I don't think it's in dispute that there were at least two employees who were working, they finished their shifts, they did not leave, they, came, they stayed, they may have changed out of the uniforms, but they stayed in and drank with Mr. McLaughlin. Correct, yes. Correct, right? So, so I don't think that that, that point, um, I think that what Ms. Mahan is saying is that her contention is that the policy previously allowed uh, employees coming off shift to drink with customers. Um, now, they may not have been uniform, but right. they came off shift and immediately basically went to the bar or the restaurant, at least in the incident in question. And that used to be allowed. And my understanding from what Mr. Leone has represented is that that is no longer allowed. Is that correct? They're not allowed to have a shift drink. No, they, no, have, to, they have to. They have to. Spoke, but they have to leave the restaurant and then come back? I can't tell them. They go, they change. Oh, I misspoke they on they that. I'm sorry. They change out of the uniform. Wherever they change that, they have a little locker area. They do change. And instead of leaving and then walking back out the door, I mean, they're not allowed to have a shift drink. They have to be a regular patron now. There's no more. We used to do a shift okay. drink complimentary for doing the shift and stuff. That's been, you know, completely off. Then I misspoke on that. I thought they had to actually leave the restaurant and come back in. Yeah. Okay. I, I, what would really kind of weigh on me more in terms of um, that policy, because I'm aware of it, you know, I'm sure everybody is, um, and especially for your liability, and I, I picked on a previous speaker, and I apologize in terms of that policy. Um, basically, I think for your, you're the manager of this 
mm -hmm. um, facility. So you can put in whatever policies, just like I understand we're going to get a recommendation from town council, but this is the Board of Selectmen. We've granted you a favor, a license, and we do have our rules and regulations, and I certainly hope, you know, whatever this board gleans out and then t makes a decision that you, you can abide by that. Um, I would be much more comfortable if I heard in concert with what I know of myself personally and what I heard previously that, you know, if you're working that day, you cannot, you know, when you get off shift, I mean, unless, you know, you go home and you come back. I mean, I haven't seen the video, but I, I have heard some other things uh, similar to the, uh, the way that I see it. This gentleman was served four or five times throughout the day, but I only see two times where um, when he ingested at least two drinks, if not more. I think the end of the night was Guinness champagne, and I. That's it. Yeah, a, a one ounce sample. I know, but I'm just going sample, yeah. by what we say. Mm -hmm. That's all. Yeah. That's all. I mean, a gentleman oh, died here. That's all I'm trying to say. I'm not hearing, for me, in terms of. I mean, I don't want to wishy wash any of this away. Um, no, no, I'm not I placing any blame on you. I understand the civil, civil ramifications. Everybody's heard ad infinitum. I am a court reporter. Commonwealth of Massachusetts, state and Rhode Island and plantations, and uh, the state of New Hampshire. So I'm, I'm certainly aware of the ramifications and the line that you're trying to walk right now. But I'm, my personal opinion, I, I seem like I'm getting bite back, and I, I, I don't see the amount of contrition that I would expect. Um, and like I said, you know, it's been 20 years. I've been over at ABCC licenses um, for all sorts of uh, violations, including this, and um, I'm sort of a little shocked by some of the, uh, my opinion, biting r remarks and retorts. I just didn't want you to misconceive. I didn't want them to be a lie going to you. I just wanted to tell you the truth, what it actually happened. Mm -hmm. When you thought that they left, I just wanted to make sure you knew they didn't. That's all I was saying. That, that was my mistake. Okay. The, the, he is taken extremely seriously. That's why we ex requested the two-week extension so we could examine all the evidence. The, um, we hadn't been privy to anything that had been um, before you folks for the last several months until we got our notice two weeks ago and we have met sat and met, met with Mr. Heim for several hours and it's not something that he's taken lightly at all which is why he's working with everyone here to demonstrate the seriousness of this issue. Has he committed similar to the alcohol surface policy which just this basically told, tells you how to card when you should card how much they look Mm -hmm. in terms of age, have you put into written form um, what I'm calling the in-uniform policy that you're talking about? So, and the reason I say that, and I've seen this at many, many, what I would consider your establishment to be, um, restaurants and, um, and the like, that um, there's another sort of code of conduct, I'm calling it an in-uniform policy, that speaks to so that every employee knows. None of that's in here in terms of when you finish a shift um, uh, in terms of when you're on shift, socializing and or um, ingesting alcohol. I mean, I remember one place I went to, they even outlined if you had a really unruly <coughs> party, just pour some water in a glass and, you know, okay, yeah, good luck, toast like that. Have you put any of this new policy, or I'm hearing it's policy that was in existence in terms of redefining the activity that I understand you're disputing, but I'm just going by what I received from um, the police department, the activities that went on here, so employees know that that is um, not allowed. I don't quite understand your question. Is the um, rules regarding employees um, staying at the bar and, and the restaurant, eating and drinking, is that written down anywhere? Or and the uniform part, that they can't be in uniform or be on duty drinking and eating at the bar. I'd like to see a copy of that if we could. Sure. No, I mean, I don't expect you to have it tonight. If you did, I'd say you're really prepared and you would anticipate. Well, I know I would have it on a computer, but I don't yeah, have it in my hand. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I would like to see that. And then um, I was concerned, especially at the end of the night, where the police report indicates he was served at least um, two drinks. I'm not going to debate. You can say, oh, it's only a Guinness and it's a glass of champagne and a small little refill. But if you've been consuming alcohol all day and mm -hmm. you've been in four or five times and only ordered food twice, that small little Guinness and champagne and refill, you know, might be the thing. Um, my personal opinion um, and, and nobody else's. I don't want to uh, monopolize everybody else's time because I'm sure they're going to um, have some questions that I will have. I'd be interested in the um, sort of a redacted list of um, the people that you've called the police department, like if you can give me an estimate on that in terms of 
we've we've done this many quarterly. We've called them five more than five times, more than ten no, times. No, no, it's three, possibly four over the year and a half. Oh, okay. It seemed like it was more. No, no. Okay. Three to it four. It seemed like you were really, the way it was represented, that you were really policing. Oh, no, no. Over, well, over a year and a half people time. People who went to other places and came a year. in there. A year. Okay. In the year. In, in the time that they've been open, it's, it's been the three, possibly four yeah. times. It's. No. Yeah. No, I'm just saying yeah. I appreciate that you represent your police, policing other institutions that might have been Well, no, that's served. more policing themselves. Want, yeah, and also the community. We want to make sure, you know, it's right. out there. It's similar to avoiding a circumstance that happened to Mr. McLaughlin. Correct. Correct. Right. What, yeah. I'm, I'm just saying, you know, it kind of put it out there. Um, you were perhaps wearing a hat bigger than you really should have. Um, I'm just wondering. Madam Vice Chair, can I, can I clarify something that you inquired? Because I don't think we got a satisfactory answer on it. Um, I agree. Um, with respect to what your policy used to be and what your policy, you're saying your policy will be now. Which you one? said that you had a shift drink policy where essentially, if I understand correctly, people were, employees were allowed to change out of their uniforms, but they were still allowed to have a drink coming off their shift. And Correct. you're saying that you're no longer going to allow that. Correct. Okay. No, and are you uh, willing to put that in writing? Yeah, we will put that as part of our operation, so that's, that's one of the things we had already. Okay. Okay, so I'd like to see pre-revision and post-revision, just so I can... You don't have to highlight the changes. I can speed read through it. And then, um, and the reason I'm saying this is, you know, I had gotten a sense that um, there were some uh, suggestions, guidance in terms of when we've had the tips violations, three days suspension, um, for, for something like this and, and looking at our rules and re regulations and not going beyond, and maybe it's something we address in the future, but we've never had a circumstance like this. Um, in terms of the suspension, because this is such a serious issue um, and not going into any facts and dispute or anything like that, um, I would want five. I don't see this as a tips violation sort of um, situation and, and I don't want to compare the two. Um, I was just wondering uh, to the gentleman at the microphone, um, if, is, is that something that if the board and I was successful in, in getting the votes that um, it would be along with two other caveats? That's something you'd be amenable to, or do you already have, maybe you have had some pr previous conversations and you kind of have a game plan and you, you're stuck hard and fast on that? Well, uh, excuse me, we don't really have a motion in front right. of us. Well, I'm just telling him where I'm going on the suspension. That's my thought. I, 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 until we have a, um, frankly, Ms. Mahan, until we have a motion in front of us and we know what we're dealing with, Mr. McGuinn doesn't want to pursue further appeal of this. We want it to end here. With a, with a resolution that's good for the town and, frankly, good for the restaurant as well. Um, a five-day suspension would cause great financial harm to the restaurant. That does 70% food? It does 70% food and 30% alcohol. It is a restaurant, as most restaurants in Arlington serve alcohol. If people know that they cannot get a drink, they won't come in. So if your revenue for one night was $8,000, and if you, a projection would be you would lose a good portion of that revenue. If you have a revenue projection of ten to $12,000 for two to three days, and you have no alcohol, you will lose a good, I, I can't say I'm not a restauranteer, but if you Bob would speak to it, what the projection loss of revenue would be. He said he's a new restaurant in town. He's at the point in his um, revenue stream where he's just about breaking even, paying his bills on time. Um, pays a lot of rent down there. It's a big spot. So a five-day suspension would <laughs> cause, cause harm to them financially. And that's where they, in the circumstances and the facts of this matter, where it is subjective, we, he feels extremely bad for what happened to Mr. Uh, uh, McLaughlin and the passengers in his car. Don't get him wrong. Don't get me wrong. It's a serious matter. It's extremely serious. I know as much as anybody about this sort of thing. Um, but to, um, that's not going to factor into... I know it's not. And I but would never be, raise that myself. I know. And I'm only raising because I. he knows Arlington's history and how we take these matters seriously. And those. that being said, he's willing to work with the town to continue to have these matters be taken seriously and 
to be a good corporate citizen in town. He appreciates what the board has done for him and, and the various things that he's been granted. And uh, as you also see, he hasn't come in for the extended license this year for New Year's Eve. He's not seeking that this year. So he's, he's smart. Yeah. In light of, yeah. Well, no, in, in light thing of, is, yeah. I have to answer it, to. Oh, I, 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 I know that. I know that. And I don't want you to perceive at all that this is a light matter that he's just going to blow off. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's not. He and I've <laughs> spent more time talking to him in the last two weeks than I want to, and that he wants to. He likes me, but you know. I know, but in terms of the community that I go in and the people that have spoken to me about this um, yeah, situation, I speak to the same and in people. terms of this is, a, you know, some, something we grant you. It's not something just because you move in. It's afforded to you. Um, mm -hmm. I know that. One and um, yeah, especially where I'm hearing it, it's only 70 percent um, sales are food. But, it, but I, I also need to demonstrate. I'm sorry. I also need to demonstrate to the many, not just parents but kids um, that I'm involved with mm -hmm. uh, that who said how serious of a matter this is and how we speak um, mm -hmm. in concert in terms of taking each issue as serious as we should um, and I guess I'm, I, myself personally I'm not hearing that and that's why I'm in the place I am last question to the town manager and then I'll stop because I'm sure my colleagues have all the other questions I want to ask if not I'll raise my hand again is, is this appropriate to ask now um, in terms of regardless of whatever the majority or unanimous board votes um, and if they take as they've kind of put on the table and threatened that they're going to you know appeal it to ABCC and basically have no penalty or fine at all in the event of that and or if for myself personally I, I don't get the seriousness of this matter actually being realized for my satisfaction. Is there anything that the town could employ, and I did have a conversation with the town manager going forward in the future, either A, in light of the fact if they just decide to appeal everything so there's no punishment, no penalty, or B, can we do it anyways on top of that? Is there a, uh, The question I'm, I'm, would be um, if there's any sort of probationary peri period, is there anything through the Board of Health, the Arlington Police Department? At, with the, without making it too cumbersome, sort of if you were on probation of some sort, to me it would s suggest some sort of extra vigilance. Is there anything that we can legally do that would not um, place any undue stress uh, work-wise on, I'm just thinking, Arlington Police Department, Board of Health, uh, whether it be requests, random requests um, to say, you know, would like to see video from, from this hour, you know, maybe once or twice a year just on a random thing to see if things are being followed. Anything like that that we can sort of, I can say, listen, I'm doing everything I can, even if they decide to appeal and they don't want to, you know, have any kind of punishment. Is there any recourse? So we can monitor and uh, review or enforce license and permit uh, compliance as we normally would for any establishment. Uh, and we can respond to any concerns that are brought to the attention of either the police department uh, or the Board of Health. But uh, in, in light of any form of this discussion, we cannot take any special or, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, extra action based on these discussions. Okay. I'll stop. So if I may, Stephen, just for a second, let me re-ask this question. Whatever this board decides to do, it is appealed. Uh, and ABCC overrules or voids or whatever the right. Uh, so, can we then come back in and have another hearing? Or, Mr. So, Chairman Green, I think we're I think we're putting the cart be, car before the horse for I a know second. We are, but, but, the, but the the ABCC uh, has review of any decision that a local licensing authority right. makes if an applicant so decides to appeal it. Right. Um, whether or not you know the parties by mutual agreement are willing to come back in, I don't. I don't know, but it would depend on the uh, actual appeal decision from the ABCC. It's hard for me to speculate exactly what they would do. They could, in theory, say, you know, we agree with the decision. They could say we disagree with the decision and we think more is appropriate. They could say, oh, we disagree with the decision entirely and we, we we void any penalty whatsoever, and that's the end of that. So it, 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 the, the ABCC has a lot of discretion as, as, as an appellate authority, um, but yes, they, it is possible that they can overturn something and that there would be 
uh, if they disagreed with the decision of this uh, board, right. that there would be but no. That's penalty. my question, Doug. They do void it, right? They can hypothetically. Yeah. They, they could do that. What's our recourse after that? Nothing, right? I, I don't know what that recourse would be, other than to you know. You when know. they appear for us next time for license renewal. I think that that would would would, would be a uh, much more involved discussion. I think we'd have to have a, a very um, uh, that that would take a level of examination that is, in other words, I don't think you can skirt around the ABCC's appeal process by then saying, you know, the ABCC is void the decision <coughs> of the local licensing authority. Well, fine, we're canceling your license under other grounds. I think you'd have to have a really sufficient and independent basis to be ready to make a decision with respect to a license renewal um, because that process could lead to further litigation that I think we do we, want, we would want to be well prepared for right okay mr. Byrne um, thank you very much mr. Greeley um, yeah, so I think we've obviously already covered a lot here but we, we've been talking a lot about the policies that you presented and you know some other pending policies that might be before us in the near future but can you talk about the implementation of these policies you know if you're not there who's in charge what's the you know, the, the, the pecking order of employees. How, and how do you, you know, when you're looking to hire a, a manager to, you know, kind of run the place at night, what do you look for uh, in that person? And, you know, is there more that can be done um, that, you know, from what you've seen and what you've learned from this to make sure this doesn't happen again? Well, in reference to the general managers in charge, and then you get floor managers and assistant general manager. Bartenders know not to serve anyone without payment and no one in uniform. It goes all the way straight down and if anyone is caught with that, they're immediately fired. Hence why I have cameras everywhere which can be seen at any time and also can be reviewed. If something happens, question them at any time we can review it ourselves as well as in the kitchen. Um, the, they have to almost police themselves. You can't just sit there and I can't stand there 24-7 mm -hmm. watching over it. It has to be some kind of, you know, uh, security within themselves. That, no, because they know this is a job. If they lose, and I've already stated this, this is something, you know, you could lose the whole place. Everything can be lost, hence why we make sure everyone gets carded, everyone gets checked for IDs. We double check with everybody with the alcohol, hence Mr. McAuliffe, and we thought we did. Same thing. It's very serious to us on all manners because it's our livelihood. This is how we make a living. I don't get rich off it. I barely make a paycheck. That's all it comes down to. But your general manager, Rodney. Yeah, Rodney. Kaysinger. General, so Rodney is the general manager. What's his last name? Kaysinger. Kaysinger. He's been the general manager since he opened, and he has how many years' experience in the restaurant business? Oh, quite a few. Uh, at least, I would say 22, 23. And he's been general manager a few times at different spots at places in Boston that are very liquor oriented. So I feel comfortable with him when he tells me things about the liquor more so. In, um, so in, uh, I appreciate that, but you know, is there any, you know, did, did you see any failures on this night in your policies that, you know, when, when we're looking at, you know, implementing new ones and, you know, kind of making a, doing a stronger job of, you know, paying attention to the policies? Maybe my, the only thing is that he revisited, I mean, granted it was over 10, 11 hours, but he revisited multiple <coughs> times throughout the day. That might be the only fault I could see in that. But of course, the first time he visited, he ate a dinner. Mm -hmm. Second time he had one drink. Third time he had a drink again. And then I think the last time he had a drink and a sip of uh, champagne. It's kind of hard to tell, but like throughout the day, that means we should have figured out where he was at beforehand, because apparently he was at some kind of party or something as well. And I can't, but again, we thought we did due diligence on handling the matter and talking to him and, you know, seeing how he handled himself. But everybody makes mistakes, everything can happen, I, and I understand. We are very, and he was very close to all the staff, everybody, his, his picture is still behind the bar, because everybody's, you know, very close to him. You know, it, it does seem that, you know, particularly because he, he was so close to all the employees, if, you know, uh, maybe that did come up in discussion over, you know, as to he was chatting and um, kind of socializing with the employees, that probably would have been helpful information to at least pick up on. And, and I, I would recommend, you know, trying to consider that as, as we do move forward here. 
And, and you know, I, I think it comes down to, and I remember when we spoke about this, um, I believe when we, when you first applied for your license and that this isn't Boston. And I know right. you have establishments in Boston and um, you know, th that's just, I, and I, I do think that Common Ground has, has brought, you know, a, a bit of liveliness to, to the center. I think you see more people out and I, I, I do appreciate that, but um, you know, when it does come down to managing a place and making responsible decisions, um, you know, I think you have to adapt to the community um, and not just look to, you know, what's worked for you in the past. So with that, I, um, I look forward to hearing, you know, Doug's proposal moving forward. So thank you. Yes, Mr. One, one, one more question, and I don't know if I'd want to, I guess I'll ask the um, town council, were the surveillance videos voluntarily offered? Yes. They were. Thank you. I want to go after you because I feel like we're not lost. No, no, go. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I'll say for me, where this gentleman was a very well-known party, um, to me it seemed like that's an easier situation versus just saying, oh, the gentleman came in four or five times throughout the day. Um, you know, I know, especially around the holidays, this was an pr extra privilege we granted you for New Year's Eve. I know I keep my eyes out. Um, especially for my loved ones, but certainly other people. I've been known to put people in a cab myself. I was just wondering if there was any discipline or retraining of the employees involved in the five different incidents. And I was wondering if um, the board could also read a, uh, receive a copy of the employees involved, um, any documentation pre-incident and or any documentation that they read, agreed to, and signed post-incident. So I would say, A, in terms of the employees that were involved with this, for me it seems like this gentleman was well known and, and the rules got really lax if there were, were any rules in place, if that. Um, so I'm just wondering, any discipline, any retraining, and can I see any pre and post this incident of the employees involved? So you can demonstrate to me that this matter was discussed with the importance that it should. Um, they read and understood it. They sign something, and they understand that if A, then B. Then if A in the future, they do this, probation, or they're on probation, or if A, they do this in the future, immediate termination. Okay, but we did not lax in any way of the policy at all. The gentleman was never served more than two drinks at okay. one particular time. He was, he was given one drink uh, on two occasions, two drinks on one occasion, and he was fed multiple times. We followed the rules that were appropriate. I can't punish employees for doing what they're supposed to do and what we tell them and dictate to them what to do and what the rules are to do. And it's he left there hard. at a .019, double the legal limit, crashed and killed himself. That's why I'm being, I'm not trying to be a stickler on this. That's the core to it. So my question was, instead of just kind of debating back and forth and saying, oh, no, I didn't, deniability and no culpability, is for the employees involved on the five different separate occasions, did you do any sort of retraining, review, any disciplinary action? And what I'd like to s ask for, if it exists, because you, you keep referencing documents, they already exist and they're going to exist. Um, for the employees involved, I would like you to demonstrate to the board whatever it is they signed th that they were hired that said these are the rules that they got lax on, in my opinion, and then these new uniform rules that I assume you now have in place that you're going to provide to the board that they've signed that. So I want to know any discipline, any retraining, regrouping, and those pre and post documents. To, to the extent just to that show they the seriousness have, to, 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 to which you take uh, it. I'm going by your representations of what you said. But, but you're, to I'm the extent stop on this, that they may is, exist, as he said, the employees didn't violate any of the policies either of the town or the restaurant in the service of the gentleman. So there may be no actual employee records where they were disciplined. It was an extremely unfortunate accident. Whether he talked to the employees afterwards or not, I... That's what I'm asking. Did he do any did kind you have of any discussion with the any employees kind of after retraining, this? any kind of your butts on the line if this happens again, or even the appearance of this? And if it was, was it, was it... Okay, you don't want to... Ex I understand. You're afraid no, 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 of don't, civil don't, stuff. Mr. Mahat, please. He's about to answer the question. Did you have any conversations with them following? We had a conversation about the, uh, what happened and went through the procedures, watched the videotape to ascertain whether they broke any policies or any rules or any ABCC rules. And with that said, we couldn't find anything. So you can't um, you know, punish anyone for doing something that they did appropriately. Um, I mean, and we just uh, they knew the gentleman 
hence he came in, but he came in like a three hour period and then another three hour period and then two hour period. It wasn't as if he was just coming in every hour doing a drink or anything. It was. He, he, he's not gonna go back and create a record to satisfy the board that something was done when there was no post disciplinary actions taken at that time. No, I'm asking for policies. Yeah, you said the there policies. were policies in existence, we, and we you will, said they've been revised, and you will provide we, them. We'll get them. I, we will get them to you. We can't do it tonight, obviously. And Vice Chair, can I, can I interject a question here? I think one of the things that would be probative, and, and the Vice Chair can correct me if I'm, in, if I'm wrong about this, mm -hmm. but when your, pol when your employees are trained um, with respect to alcohol, do they sign uh, the training manual or anything like that? So there's no record of them signing. Give it to them and tell them to read it, and this is the policy. And we ask them questions periodically throughout the time that they're there to make sure. And if, and if it were to be probative to this board for there to be some kind of retraining, would they be willing to sign to confirm that they have been retrained in, the board, in, in, in terms of your old policies and your policies as revised? I'll be happy to. I have no problem with that. I, I know that's not the entire scope of what the vice chair was asking, but I think mm. it was at least a part of it. I'm sorry, I just wanted to make sure, because I don't think I was understanding that, that, that either. So there is no written confirmation that these employees have been, have been trained. I know that you're representing to us that they've been trained, but you don't have anything that says they've been trained in the right. old policy. Right. And with respect to the new policy and any changes to that, you might be willing to, if, if they were retrained and, and for them to sign that they understand this new policy? Yeah. So, I'm not saying that just, satisfies all concerns. You just said they don't sign anything, and yet you provided a document to us that requires them to sign it. Well, it has a signature place on it. Say what? You yeah. say it has a signature line on it, but he doesn't collect the signature yeah, line. Yeah, I, I give it to him to read. I don't actually make them sign it and hand it back in. But you will change that from here I forward. will change that, yes, Including I said. Including the shift policy and... The shift policy has been changed already, right. yes. Uh, so, are you, are you so, you know... A number of questions have been asked here, and it, it's as, as we always say, uh, alcohol consumption in Arlington must be done legally and responsibly. Somehow, there's some responsibility here. Um, and so, you know, I would, are the two employees that were with Mr. McLaughlin that night still working for you? One is not, and the, <coughs> and the the daughter has gone back to school full time, so she's not as well. The other lady is, yes, and she's a waitress right now. I mean, this is just such a terrible tragedy, and the fact that his daughter was in the car with him just breaks my heart. But I'm curious, did you do anything with the employee that still works for you that provided false information to the police at the scene of the accident? I did not know that until the time I met with until we got the report that's this the week. first time I've ever heard of that the happening and I have not had a chance to sit down and talk with her since then okay. and I do plan on it and I understand that the accident happens some people get they say things or whatever and I'm not too sure and I can't make a judgment until I talk to her about it will you talk to her about it oh yes I will okay I mean I, I, I understand this is not a direct line but there's enough of a line back to common ground uh, in my opinion, that there is certainly some fault here. And, uh, you know, just shape up. Uh, do you have a recommended uh, motion for us, Mr. Uh, Hine? I do, Mr. Chairman. Um, at, the, at the outset, I want to recognize that uh, the stakes of this are very high, that the, um, uh, all Section 69 violation cases are by their very nature close cases because they involve uh, what Ms. Mahan will recognize as an element of scienter. In other words, what people knew inside their heads or should have known, and those are very, very difficult cases to prove. I also, uh, accordingly, I note that license uh, modifications, suspensions, revocations vary extremely widely in uh, Section 69 uh, cases. I consulted with the ABCC. I surveyed surrounding communities to find, uh, to try to find examples of penalties um, for Section 69 violations that would somewhat fit into this fact pattern. I will say that because each case uh, differs, I wasn't able to find something that directly falls in line here. I will note that many Section 69 cases, especially for first offenses, only result in a warning. Uh, that being said, I think in light of what the board has said, 
um, I think that a warning would be insufficient in this case. Uh, this is an atypical case for Arlington. As such, the chairman authorized me to enter some uh, preliminary uh, uh, discussions with uh, Mr. Oguin and counsel for Mr. Oguin, Mr. Leone. Uh, there's obviously a significant disagreement with the assertion that overservice actually occurred, but as we've seen here, they do share concerns and are willing to stipulate that they will not appeal in the interests of goodwill, finality, and certainty to the following terms which I recommend, and I will also note importantly, the Chief of Police finds acceptable as well. Uh, first, at the outset, a three-day suspension starting the day which the violation occurred. With an additional 14 days or two weeks suspension held in abeyance for a one-year probationary period. That essentially means that if Common Ground has any violations whatsoever of alcohol policies or rules within the next, uh, within the calendar year from when they start serving uh, their suspension, that they would automatically have a 14-day uh, alcohol suspension in addition to whatever additional penalties might be incurred for that violation, whether that violation is very big, whether that violation is very small. In addition, a one-year probation on any extended hour requests. So not only the New Year's Eve um, issue that I think the board, uh, some members of the board referenced earlier, Mr. Leone referenced earlier, but, um, um, but uh, a sort of moratorium for a year on any extended hour requests. Additionally, uh, as Mr. Leone has uh, represented, a stipulation to a change of policy with respect to shift drinks, which would essentially eliminate that practice in the restaurant. While uh, generally speaking, the board only has the ability to modify, suspend, or revoke a license, if they stipulate to that condition, uh, it can be agreed upon. And um, I would only note that today it appears that they're also willing to um, stipulate to retraining and signing um, the uh, policies that they um, uh, the, the revised policies that they would put forth. Uh, that's my recommendation to the board. If the board has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Mr. Dunn. So um, I've, I read the, so the memos that came, you know, related to this, and uh, it's a tough, it, it's been very hard for me to resolve where we as a, like, where we as a board and where I as a board member should, should come out. Uh, because there's just so many unknowns and there's things that even if we, you know, even if we had subpoena power and we, you know, we could f figure things, all that out, I'm not sure that we would even learn the answers, like, learn to, you know, for certainty with that, with those powers. Uh, and so that said, uh, the fact that we have gotten, the, the Doug, uh, town council has gotten us to a place uh, with the common ground where they've agreed to a set of uh, of terms, I have. Uh, it's very easy for me to support that. So I, um, I move that we uh, act exactly as Doug, uh, as the town council has outlined. Okay. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second that. Second. Um, I'll have a comment as, okay. as well. And um, I, um, I do want to thank um, Doug for all his work on this. I know um, there, there was quite a bit that went into it. I, I will say I'm, I'm a bit surprised. Um, a look at learning through the process um, about how the ABC kind of how what their process is, um, and that that it seems like this um, the, the the penalty that um, Doug put put forward is probably the the harshest that um, we would realize in in this situation, and and I am um, um, I think that the two week penalty is a is a really big sticking point for me because. If there is a any lax in these new drawn up um, policies at all, I mean they'll probably go out of business. Uh, I think if you if you yep. were to shut down for two weeks, that that's what it seems like um, to me. So I think um, I think there's enough um, you know motivation to to get this right and, and move forward and make sure this doesn't happen again. So thank you. Okay, Ms. Mahan, next. Uh, <clears throat> First and foremost, with all due respect. Um, it's for this board um, to decide what penalties there should be, if any, not what the gentlemen at the microphone are saying. This is a punishment that we'll agree to, um, and that's it. I, I, I don't, I take that with the spirit it's given, um, and I, I, I kind of don't like that sort of threat hanging over here. If I were in your shoes, I would see whatever this board sort of mets out, um, take it, move, and um, learn from it. 
Uh, I'm not satisfied with, in my opinion, sort of the double talk answers that I got. A policy exists, it doesn't exist. And, um, and all I'm hearing is you did nothing wrong, everything's fine. I understand civil issues, um, but that really bothers me. So um, I would like to, I will not, uh, I can support everything that's there, but I would like to impart, um, and I may not get the votes at all, you may already have it all set to go. Um, um, in light of the fact of the seriousness of, of the matter, the ultimate outcome, what I heard from the microphone, um, uh, the sort of double talk policies, they're trained, but nothing's been signed, and here is our policy. The fact that the gentleman does do business in Boston, and I know from working years ago in that venue, um, you know, a lot of what I'm being told um, really should have been in place, especially being in an Austin Brighton environment. Um, in light of the facts, it's 70% sales for, f for food. And also, for me to sort of met out punishment, that I can demonstrate to others that I took this as a, as a serious issue, um, as everybody does. I'm not saying that anybody doesn't um, on this side of, of the table that um, I'm not going to, in terms of the suspension, basically give them the same suspension when um, the three-day suspension is for a TIPS violation. Nobody drank then and nobody drove and died, uh, as in this situation. So I don't know that I have the votes. I would agree with everything that Mr. Dunn has stated, uh, with the exception of a five-day suspension. So if not, um, we'll see how the vote goes. But I really want to demonstrate, not that we're, this is what our punishment or penalty is going to be because that's what they'll agree to and they're not going to appeal it. That, that really, I'm, I'm kind of insulted by that. My thing is, you know, suck up, take your medicine, and let's try to learn from this and move on. And I guess you're going to show us all these other things. You're just finding out in terms of a representation to the police by an employee that you didn't know about. I find that hard to believe. Um, you're, you're saying, you know, you have policies, but nobody has to sign them, and you're going to do that now. So I would like to say, in light of what I've heard, and when I, I go back to the citizenry, that um, we took the extra step of not giving him a three days tips violation suspension. We gave him a five day. So that's sort of my pitch. Mr. Carroll. I think, like my colleagues, um, this has been a very difficult one for me. I think my initial reaction was probably similar to, to, to Ms. Mahan's that, that, you know, typically on a first violation, we have meted out three days. My, tip, my initial reaction when this was brought forward to us was that this should be something more serious. In looking at it, though, and in long discussions with town council and reading the um, investigatory report, I, I recognize that, that that reaction is informed by um, the tragic outcome of the incident, not fully by the behavior of, of the establishment, and that, that's something that we have to um, take into account. In, the, uh, in most of the hearings that we have on, on these matters, um, we actually have the, 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 the establishments dead to rights because they've, they've served underage um, patrons and, and have, have very clearly um, violated our, um, our policies. I, I feel a sense of urgency because of, because of the, the, the tragedy that, that accompanied this. At the same t time, I, I also recognize that, that um, this is an adult, and there was some um, shared culpability there, which, which we, we can't necessarily ascribe to a minor going into an, an establishment like this. Um, I, I want to thank town council and, and the police department for the long hours that they spent uh, on this. I, I will support the motion. Um, I only feel comfortable supporting the motion because of the addition of the, the probationary period of two weeks and the fact that, that it includes a, um, a general prohibition on any um, extended hours. Um, I, I, I think it would be <clears throat> actually a disgrace to Mr. McLaughlin's uh, memory if we were to extend um, hours this, this, um, this year. Um, 
or the next. So I, I will be supporting the motion, uh, but I, I do so um, only after long reflection and um, some, some real um, questions that I've had to ask myself on this. Okay, I just want to uh, be clear. There was nothing decided here. Uh, Mr. Heim has acted uh, at my direction, and he and I have discussed what uh, would be offered here tonight, but it's completely up to this board in terms of what this board uh, wishes to do after now hearing all the facts. We encouraged each of you to speak with town council to whatever degree is necessary, but I don't like any implication that things were decided before we walked in this room before the hearing ever took place. Uh, why I support the motion by Mr. Dunn is it has been our policy that for first offenses we have been consistent that it is a three-day suspension. Um, and any business that can run losing 30% a night uh, for longer than three days or five days or 14 days, this is by far the most serious um, uh, punishment we have ever handed out in my 27 years here on the Board of Selectmen. And now, additionally, having asked, and I believe we will receive, these additional new uh, training and assurances from the owner, from, the, from a Councilor uh, 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 Mr. Leone, uh, I believe this is very serious in the way that we're taking this, and I support the motion uh, as made by Mr. Dunn. Does anybody else wish to speak on this matter? Mr. Greeley? Yes. Mr. Burn, did you? I already spoke. Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. What? What did you want to? No, no, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Okay. My fault. All those in favor by on the uh, motion? Well, so first of all, did you make an amendment or you just said you had a wish there? Um, I was putting it out to see what remarks from my colleagues would come back. Um, I just want to say that my remarks were based on what I heard fresh here tonight from town council who indicated that um, in conversations with the uh, proponents council that this is something that they agreed they wouldn't appeal. That's So I, if I gave any uh, uh, semblance of the fact that something was already decided before we walked in here tonight, no. Th what I was saying was that, you know, the attorney and um, Mr. O'Quinn have said, if you just do this to us, we won't um, appeal it. And that's what I took umbrage with. So I apologize if I implied any sort of, uh, I just didn't appreciate the sentiments expressed in terms of meting out your own punishment. So right. I'm ready for a vote. Okay. All those in favor of the motion by Mr. Dunn, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. Okay, four to one. So Mr. Heim, the process from here is what? Uh, Mr. Greeley, I'll have to draft a formal opinion as, as you know, uh, in consistent practice with our previous uh, decisions, and then that uh, will be put before the board at uh, its next regular meeting um, for the board's uh, review to make sure it's consistent with everything that, uh, that we've discussed here tonight. And, and then um, common ground is 30 days to institute the suspension? I think that's been our typical practice. I'll make sure that that's, that that's consistent and that we've got everything uh, appropriately, uh, and again, consistent with what we've done, I think, in the last round of uh, suspensions last year. But we'll, we'll make sure it uh, reflects all the things that are appropriate to our previous practice and all the things that are specific to this case. Okay. Is it New Year's Eve was Wednesday night, so we'll start on a Wednesday night? Right, it would be Wednesday, Thursday, that Friday it is? nights, right, correct. That's our policy. I mean, that's my memory. So no, was it right. Wednesday night? It is Wednesday. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. And uh, tingling with excitement at this opportunity, is there anybody here wishing to speak on the Citizens Open Forum, Marie? Anybody sign in? Yep. Yeah, I have a few. Mr. Tibbetts? Gary. Uh, I'm uh, Gary Tibbetts from Precinct 5. I'm a town meeting member, and I'm also a member of the, the uh, Arlington Business Association. And over the last couple of weeks, we became aware of uh, a um, thing that was put forward by uh, Stephen Byrne um, as far as banning trucks on Jason Street. I've talked to Steve a couple times about it. Uh, he's been very helpful. And um, <clears throat> I guess the latest uh, thing of it is that it would be um, uh, local and service and delivery trucks would be exempt from it. Right. And I had suggested to Stephen um, that most truck bans have some sort of weight on them. 
um, to make them enforceable uh, because there is no such thing as an empty weight in a truck. Uh, the only thing that's registered and weighed in on a truck is the gross vehicle weight, which is the loaded weight. And if you look at throughout the state, if you look at places where there are truck bans in effect, it'll always tell you the weights that are banned. And even if you go over important things like the Sagamore Bridge or the Bourne Bridge, it'll even show you by axle what it is. Um, Stephen told me that uh, you, your main interest was in banning the big trailers going to Whole Foods and um, Stop and Shop and Walgreens, and, and I get that. Um, you know, those trucks weigh in at um, usually around 65, 75,000 pounds. The local trucks that we use top out at about 40,000 pounds. And so we'd like to, you know, if, if you're going to put signs up, make them enforceable and make them things that people can live with and, you know, maybe put a 40,000 pound limit on Jason Street. Um, it, it just makes sense and it's, it's the way DOT does it and everything. And, um, you know, so you we were hoping we could work with you on that, that's all. And, um, you know, in the past sometimes we've run to put restrictions in without talking to the people it really concerns. And, um, you know, he had said you're more than content with, you know, the landscape is the oil delivery guys, the package delivery guys driving on Jason Street, they have to. This would allow them to do it legally. Uh, because the other issue is if, you know, if you don't put a weight limit on it, and, you know, the Arlington police are aware of it, that's fine. But if a state trooper follows you up Jason Street and pulls you over, he's going to write you up. So, because he's not going to know the local jog in here. So, I was just hoping you just, when that comes about, you could consider putting a weight limit like 40,000 on it, something like that. All right? Okay? Yeah, sure. Yep. I mean, we're just here. There's a few of us came tonight. We got Billy and I got more calls about this than anything. Uh, that's and why. leaf blowers? Well, that no. Do <laughs> <laughs> you know how it turned out, Newton? By the way, Gary. I do not know. Yeah. I I don't I don't think a, they, they. I think they were going to ban them completely. No, they implemented a sort of policy. I think they really? went. I read it in the Globe. Yeah, they went. I was so persuasive. That must be it. <laughs> over there. Well, they so, asked. But but I agree with you, Gary. So. Uh, how do we do this? Do we request through DOT or when it comes back, Adam? So my understanding of the request, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, to DOT is it's based on federal highway designated uh, vehicle class and not weight. Right. Uh, my understanding of bridge restrictions are those bridges literally can't hold that weight. It's, right. it's, not, a, it's not a preference. It's an actual engineering right. thing. Uh, so this goes from um, federal highway class 4 all the way up through 13. 4 starts with buses. Up through 13 is your biggest track of trailer truck. So I think maybe a little homework uh, with TAC, maybe with Jeff Max Tutis, we can just get a little more clarity on what exactly is included in 4 through 13, what those definitions are, what the GVWRs are, uh, gross vehicle weights are in those classes, and then we can try to parse it out like that. Very good. Okay. Thank you. And if Thank you, you can make sure the school buses that use that route a lot, because um, you point. said buses. It, it's yeah. noted in the letter that yeah. it's a bus safe road to school and that buses yeah. use it as well. I'm just saying if we adopt the federal. Yeah. And, okay. and it is just, you know, I think... Kev, if I can, it's important to note that anyone who is working or making deliveries can use it, you know, like it's no signs at all. And we don't even know what MassDOT's going to say about it. So look, I think we could be getting a bit ahead of ourselves. I would like to see what their reaction to the letter first. Good evening, everybody. I'm Bob Lalacata, running a business called Little Green Landscaping for a number of years, and now it's Lalacata Landscape Products. Um, I'm involved with this group for a reason is I supply and deliver materials. Now, if it's because uh, of the heavier style trucks go running up and down Jason Street, that's understandable. I don't think I'd want them through my neighborhood. We've lived up on Ridge Street for 21 years. But neither here or there. I need a way to get to Jason Street. I've got customers there. I've got customers off the side streets of Jason Street. Arlington is very difficult to drive around in any way. So, of course, we're taking Oakland Avenue. We're taking Gray Street. We're taking Ridge Street to get to wherever we need to supply customers in this town. So, you know, Gary had said the 40,000 GVW, that, that, that is a truck that holds that amount of material loaded. So a 5,000 ton or 5,000 pound weight limit, all that is is a pickup truck driving up and down the street, because that's what a 10,000 GV, like a 5,000 GVW truck loaded would carry, would be a pickup truck carrying two yards of loam. So you'd be going, driving around, delivering two yards of loam in a pickup truck, and that's the best you could do under the rate, uh, weight restrictions, I think it's on Lake Street. We need greater than that. Gary mentioned 40. I wouldn't mind going with 45. 
You know, let the oil trucks with the dual wheels be able to do deliveries. Alex Oil, uh, De Devaney, whoever has those larger style oil trucks to make oil deliveries to these people's houses and homes. I mean, I do understand the fact that, you know, we've got some population issues here that we have to deal with. Go right ahead. I apologize. I'm not trying to interrupt. I was putting myself in line once you're done. Oh, I see. I did not mean to interrupt. I apologize. But I've got other people here that want to speak. But like I said, from a business standpoint, I mean, I, I think this, this could work. But we've got to have some sort of limits. So just don't put the sign up there because all of a sudden that person makes that phone call. We've got trucks running up and down uh, Jason Street. All of a sudden, Lalacata's truck goes by. There's the police officer. He's got to write a citation. He got a complaint. And who am I going to bring that $100 ticket to? It's a $100 fine. Who am I going to bring it to? Stephen Byrne. All right. So please take that into consideration, the small guy who's doing his work in town. You know, I mean, you're going to have cement mixes. You're going to have DNR construction doing road paving and all sorts of jobs of that nature. But that's a pot. That's, that's a quick thing, you know, municipality type of work. But, you know, just keep in mind the, the small guy who's trying to make a living in this town and lives in this town. And grew up in this town. Thank you very much. Right. I think we're all in agreement. Also, right? you have questions? Yeah. Uh, I think we're all in agreement, but also we have to listen to residents as well. I agree. You understand that. Mr. Dunn. So first off, I voted against it. So, but even having, even having been opposed to it, you understand that this, even the proposed regulation doesn't affect you when you're making deliveries. But a cut through could. If, what if I got someone on okay. Kensington? I want to go out, you know, I'm going to take Jason to uh, Gray Street to Kensington. You know, I mean, I got to go up and around Pleasant Street. I got to go up Oakland Avenue, cut across down got Gray it. Street. I got to go to Park Avenue, the Watertown, down Eastern Avenue. I mean, around the world and back. And I don't okay. think it's fair to, to, to us who are trying to run a, an establishment. Now, what do the guys cutting lawns do? They stop on the side street to go run their mowers a quarter of a mile down Jason Street to do a lawn, uh, a lawn service. So, and I understand, but listen, I cut my grass, I'm shooting, I um, was raking leaves yesterday. There goes the UPS driver, FedEx, mail truck from up the street. I mean, it's our everyday way of life, delivery. People don't pick up things anymore. Everything gets delivered. You know, Bob's furniture, you know, Jordan's, they're all over the place. You drive anywhere around town, someone's making a delivery. There's trucks up and down these streets. So just like, again, I'm repeating myself. I'm a dinosaur that died back with the dinosaurs. You know, just, you know, if you can raise those limits to 40, 45,000 GVW, that would be a big help to a lot of people. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. He's so shy, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> Such a sin. Hi, I'm Bill Downing. Uh, I'm from Precinct 15, uh, town meeting member. Um, I don't have a lot to add. Um, however, when we put truck uh, put signs up that say that ban trucks, uh, and of course the people that live there are entitled to have services, so you got to run your truck up to to the service. I have accounts on all those streets, um, whether it's uh, Jason, Pleasant View, Stony Brook, Lincoln, and I'm on Jason Street all the time. Now. I park my car in the morning at my garage. I get in my truck. It's a small dump truck, 12,000 gross vehicle weight. And I'll drive up Jason Street. And I may not stop to do work. I might just have to look at an account so I can direct my men later in the day. I'm going to be banned. I, I'm not going to be able to go on Jason Street unless I'm stopping to do work. I'm not going to be exempt. Uh, that's the concern here. If we are going after tractor trailers, let's put that GVW, 45,000 pounds. Those, those trucks are all 45 and highest, usually 60,000 GVW. Put that as the restriction, and you can pull them over all day long. Now, there has been a lot of trucks up there this summer. Uh, there were two houses being built on the bottom of Spring Street. There was a house being built on the top of uh, Kensington Park. It was a huge DPW project being done on Hillsdale in Brunswick. There was a lot of trucks over there, you know? Um, I think uh, all I'm trying to say is, uh, let's get the, if we're gonna do this, let's do it right, you know? Um, I, I don't have much more to add. I don't wanna take up any more of your time. I, I appreciate you letting me talk, and thank you very much. If anybody has a question, I, I'd be you, happy any to. Any questions? No. Okay. I think we're all set. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we want to set the weight restriction at 45,000, I'm getting. I, I don't think we have the right I, I, to do that. I think MassDOT tells us what the issue But should be. we amend our letter and send that? Should we? 
Do, would you like me to respond? I'm asking, I, to, to I, throwing it out there. My, my um, t tonight, my understanding of the actual restriction and its implementation is not expert, and I'd like to talk with TAC and with the engineer to get more information about it. But from the information I do have, I, I don't think that any of the concerns that the gentlemen have raised will be an issue. I, I, I'd like to credit our police department with enough discretion that if Mr. Downing was pulled over and he said, I have accounts on this street and I'm just reviewing those accounts, that they would not be citing him ba based in the spirit of the law. That said, I think if we do a little more research, I can inform the board of what, what the right next step is. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. So uh, anybody else for Citizens Open Forum? Next, uh, traffic rules and orders uh, from the uh, Arlington Bicycle Advisory Committee. We've we'll waited patiently. Good evening, everybody. I'll wait till Scott joins me, if, you don't, okay. if that's okay with you guys. Okay, well, I must have <laughs> oh, We're here for two reasons tonight, and one, the, one of the reasons has two parts, and it's um, we're recommending you uh, write a letter of support, which we could actually draft for you if you approve it. Uh, it's on two, it's letters of support for um, some legislation that's passing through the state legislature that's to do with bicycling, and therefore it affects us, and in our capacity as being an advisory board towards you, we're recommending that you, you take this action. So we have, um, one is a, there's a, an act passing through the Senate and the House um, to protect v vulnerable road users. And this is not just cyclists, it should be pointed out. It's um, people such as wheelchair users, mot motorcyclists, equestrian, road workers, emergency responders, and so on. Right now, Massachusetts has a pass at a safe distance. We just want to specify possibly a minimum safe distance of being three feet. And this is in line with about 20 other states currently. So we feel that's a fairly reasonable um, request to make and a reasonable uh, proposition to go to, be, to go into state law. The uh, second act Wait, is. Do you want a motion on that first question? Do you want to take them separately? Or do you want to take them together? No. We we'll do them separately. Yes, fine. Yeah. So do you want a motion? I, I think on that? I might want to do it separately. Actually, because okay. I have yep. a question before we make a motion on so this. So do you one. have a question on this? I do on this legislation. Okay. Can Can you talk about how it how it works in other states and how the you know police have been you know kind of using their judgment to see three feet. I assume that it happens pretty quickly. Yes, yeah, so let, um, let me have Scott um, have a quick word on this because he, he's actually was looking at some articles, sorry, he was looking at some articles recently um, and just showing me some of them. So I think he possibly might have a better handle on the actual what other states do, unless you just want me to say something. Okay, all right. Uh, Scott Smith, member of ABAC, uh, that uh, that's a question that often comes up, and uh, one thing that's appeared in the media is uh, some folks fixed up a little rangefinder, put it on a bike, and this is Chattanooga, Tennessee, of all places, uh, doing it and basically using it as an educational tool when there are violations, so it's not that hard to enforce. So a motion? Oh, uh, oh Ms. Mahan? Um, um, I have a question. Yep. It, it applies to both. Um, has ABAC already indicated their support and yes. notified the legislature? Normally... Um, well, we haven't done it separately <coughs> because we felt that it would have more um, weight coming from you as selectmen. And our job, in fact, is to advise you. That's kind of what our title is. If you think it's going to have more weight, Mugar. Uh, that's what so we felt. On. But I'm, I'm just sort of a little bit cognizant of the fact that normally when I consider um, signing on to legislation, it's either from my colleagues, whether in, in Arlington or throughout the community, or um, if the town manager recommends thus, and I haven't done it all the time, but more times than not I have. I just don't want to, uh, I appreciate that you th think that the, this board of selectmen is, you know, um, would carry that much weight. I would hope that it would, um, but I can tell you there are quite a oh, few. We, we have discussed it in our meetings, of I know, course, but I'm, I'm, what I'm saying is we're sort of opening the door here um, in terms of all these different subcommittees. This is, it isn't something that um, we asked for the creation of. I was wondering if the town manager had any guidance on, of course this board can do whatever it wants. I don't think I can vote for the second one because I don't really understand it and I'm not an expert in, in bicycle usage. And, and then the other thing is um, I'd be interested in, um, if I supported this, 
the imp impacts of actually enforcing it. Because I can't tell you how many people have said to me, how come the cops aren't out there taking in the bicycle riders that fly through, through the red lights and you know, don't obey the rules of the road? And I say, well, yeah, I know that law's out there, but it's really hard to enforce given what a day-to-day -day, um, active police force has to do. I'm not saying they don't do it, but um, so this, I'm, I'm a little wary of terms of supporting legislation because I can see it, everybody, I mean, I, I agree probably with the spirit. I understand one a little bit more, I don't quite get two, so. I would like them to be taken separately, and I'm still on the fence whether it, I think it just should come from ABAC and whoever, but I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. May I? No. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Ms. Mahan. Uh, so in terms of enforcement, that's a very good question. So as you know, uh, the Arlington Police Department does not have a dedicated traffic enforcement unit in terms of cars or, or, or men or women out on the street enforcing traffic. That's something the Chief and I are working on trying to begin to rectify in FY17. It's actually something that's pretty near and dear to me as a you know, multimodal user and, and seeing some of the things you're describing myself. Um, so I agree with you. Um, w w existing policies, new policies, whatever they might be, uh, we can certainly try to focus either existing staff or new staff on doing a better job of enforcement. Um, in terms of uh, my opinion on these two bills, if that's part of what you were asking. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that it's very clear that we have a lot of people who use bicycles as a mode of transit in, in Arlington. Uh, it's becoming part of the Arlington culture. I think we're seeing this infrastructure built in Arlington and in surrounding places, and our laws don't necessarily match up with the upgrades in infrastructure and the new types of infrastructure. And I think these laws start to recognize those infrastructures, changes and upgrades, and the need to govern them and regulate them in different ways. So I, I am in support of them. Okay. Um, to the following, uh, to, the, to the last question of whether or not it should come straight from ABAC or the board, um, you know, I think there is a certain imprimatur that comes when the Board of Selectmen votes and says that they're in 5-0 or whatever, whatever the vote may be in support of a particular piece of legislation. Um, but if the board wants to not incentivize, you know, too many requests for support for bills coming before them, you know, maybe it's subject to a further board discussion about how we should start to process those. But I, I, I do think there's something um, about the governing body signing on that carries more weight, for, for what it's worth. I also feel I'm not sure you'd be terribly happy if we sent off lots of letters doing, saying we approve this, that, and the other without telling you or letting you know about that. Yeah, that might lead to lead to a real that, conflict. That, that's your expertise. I don't. And I, that's that's fine. My thing is, if we're going to do this for one, then we're going to have to do it for everybody. That's just my opinion. Yeah, but and I, and I would love to think we carried that much weight. Talk to our legislative delegation on Mugar and mass housing. Right. I don't think we have that. So, much. But, you know, yeah. Christopher. Yeah, it's been waiting, but it's okay. been I'm sorry. That. Yeah. Christopher does raise a good point. You know, if an individual committee started uh, submitting letters of support for bills, it could create a situation where a delegation quickly comes back to me or comes back to the board and says, what's, "What's going on with this? Yeah, you know, are you in support of this?" And then pushes it back to the board anyways. So ha having the board. Um, I, and I guess I say that based on the assumption that we don't always all agree on everything, right? So a committee could have a different opinion uh, than the board. So I do think having the board vote um, is, is a good good idea. Mr. Dunn. So um, first I'm going to move the, the, the board support the recommendation. Um, Second. Uh, and uh, I don't know if we're going to get to five, but uh, we're going to have the conversation one way or, or get to three. Excuse me. We're going to have the conversation. Uh, I... Um, so I'm, I'm comfortable with the various committees coming to us with legislation at various points in time. If the Committee on Dis uh, Commission on Disabilities came to us and said, hey, there's this thing going through state law that I think is going to make a big difference for the way I'd want them to come to us and talk about it. Uh, if the Tree Commission saw something that was happening you know, in the, related to the legislation that was going to make their jobs easier, make the town better, I'd want them to come to us and talk to about us about it. I think that there's, like a, there's a limiting factor here in that there, all these other committees are generally you know, somewhat busy as well, and they're only, you know, they, there's, we don't have a lot of committees that are in the habit of wasting everybody else's time, and should that actually happen, I'll worry about it you know, uh, uh, when we get there. On the merits of this very specific bill, um, as you all know, I'm a bicyclist. I bike into Illinois a lot. I bike down into Boston. Um, I have been known to bike to this meeting, though not in the last couple of months. Um, and uh, it's addressing a real problem. This is not a, a, I don't think that this is a, sometimes you can look at things and you say this is the solution that's looking for a problem. There really is a problem related to public safety, and I think that this is uh, the type of thing that will help uh, improve that. I have similar comments on the next one, but I'll hold off. But uh, so in the interest of public safety and my personal experience, 
uh, I'm happy to support this. Ms. Carroll, did you want to? I, I think Mr. Dunn. Something. Okay. Yep. Okay. Further discussion on this. All those in favor of the motion by Mr. Dunn, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Was it 5-1? Yeah, okay. no, it's the next one that I'm... 5 -0. Okay, Thank right. you. Uh, on that. Okay, so the second one, Chris. The second one is to, um, to encode that parking on bike lanes in, is actually an offense rather than, oh, whatever the technical term is, I'm sorry, um, rather than just allowing people to park on a bike lane. For example, if you're cycling down Mass Ave towards Alewife and you c encounter a delivery truck parked on the bike lane, in that narrow bit just before you hit Cambridge, you're going to have to go right around the, the, the truck, which is a dangerous maneuver for a cyclist to make. Uh, it's not necessarily easy for a cyclist to look behind himself, <coughs> check that everything's okay in the front. Uh, unlike a car, the rear view mirrors aren't as, as a satisfactory solution. And therefore, you know, moving from your, your uh, protected bike lane, or not protected, uh, marked bike lane, into and round a vehicle that's parked in traffic uh, whether that vehicle could just move three feet and park in the roadway, I, we feel is uh, something that needs to be supported. And currently it's not illicit to do that. We'd like it, that to be so. And this is what this bill tries to encode. Mr. Dunn. Uh, I move approval. Uh, my, second. My sec second uh, comment, so I haven't had this experience yet in Arlington. The bike lanes are relatively fresh in, on Mass Ave, and I have not uh, you know, traveled them that much. I particularly experienced this, and the, given we are talking about a state regulation, not Arlington, so my experiences in Cambridge are relevant. Uh, if you're biking through Central Square down Massachusetts Avenue, they have really big bike lanes. They're really nice. They really, Cambridge really works to encourage it. You have a car that's double parked because it's gone into Dunkin' Donuts because it's, um, they couldn't, they're picking up their food at Mary Chang's, like whatever it is. You as a bicyclist have to suddenly merge into a traffic lane and that traffic lane doesn't really know that you're coming. And then you have to come back out. And that merge, like, so you're coming towards a truck or a parked car, and then you have to merge into a traffic lane that up until then has had all these bikes, you know, just coexisting next to them, but suddenly you have that intersection. That's where it gets dangerous. And uh, I've absolutely had difficult and close calls with that experience. And so even of the two, this is the one, frankly, that to me is the, uh, is the most distressing. Like, when we carve out that bike lane for the protection of bicyclists, we have to protect that. Or it's uh, it was point it was pointless. Yes, Mr. Kuro. Christopher, does this um, apply only to dedicated bike lanes, or I believe uh, so. Yes. Shared. Yes. Shared lanes, no, dedicated, dedicated ones, not shared ones, because there's no specified lane. Right. Thank you. Okay. Anything? All set. All those in favor of the motion by Mr. Dunn, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed. Okay. Christopher. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, our second matter is that we've received communication from the uh, Rails to Trails Conservancy that they wish to uh, install a sign um, to commemorate the rail origins of our rail trail. Um, and they've also contacted Lexington and Bedford, and they're, going, they're prepared to uh, make a sign for us that will be in good graffiti-proof, etc. Uh, condition. They will cite it wherever we want it, um, they will write it, but then we, they will send us the copy, and we have approval of that, and we can amend it. Um, and there's no charge to the town for installation, manufacture, or even upkeep of it. So um, we feel this is a, you, we can't lose on this. Um, it's something I think would be an enhancement to the rail trail. All we have to do is talk about a location. So we wanted to bring this up to you, and uh, we had a couple of locations we suggested. Uh, there are several we rejected. If you want to come up with some alternative ones, we can discuss what we thought. But we the, we suggest opposite the dog park um, down at, near Alewife at that end. And then there's the old um, Lake Street Rail Station. Uh, I can't remember its real technical name, but maybe Lake Street Station that was existed. It still exists as a small pocket park. Uh, there are a couple of benches there. That might be another, another good location. There is an existing historical sign there which we would like to move because it's right on the edge of the trail and if anybody stops to look at it, they're being pe they impede the trail. So we want to make sure that when these get sighted, we give a location that allows people to gather around, look at them, but not impede traffic on the trail, either bicycles or pedestrians or strollers or anything else. And there's the communication that we've had with Rails to Trails is included in your package. So 
I think you have a... So all we're doing right now is accepting the signs. And right? possibly saying which location you would like or you prefer. I move approval that we accept the signs and place them in the recommended spots by ABAC. It's just one sign and we just gave you oh, one no, spot you, and an alternative. Two. No, no, they're we're just giving so you an alternative. So we didn't want to just say it's going to be here. Right. Uh, we, we like to give people choices. Yeah, right or wrong. I thought we were getting two. Um, no, I'm afraid not. Lexington's getting one and Bedford's getting yeah. one, so. We take one of theirs. <laughs> well, if you've got a wrench, me no, I don't I think it, it it's vandal proof. So. The high school yeah, yeah, scavenger yeah. hunt, I know nothing about. Second. So, so I think I like the spot at um, the Lake Street station. Are we all happy? Mr. Chairman, may I make a request? Okay. Can you please conf uh, just confirm um, either with my office or with another office that we in fact own the property that we're putting in the precise location? I doubt it'll be an issue, but I just want you to double check with us. Yes, that sounds reasonable. We can, we can do that. <laughs> Actually, yeah, Mr. Girl. Had a few mysteries lately. You just you just sparked a, um, a a thought in my head. Doesn't the rail trail come under the manager as it is? I think he's just asking where the selectman would like to place this. <laughs> okay, so this is just an expression of support. We've already discussed this with the town manager, yep. and he's in general support of the, the proceedings. Correct. Okay, so we can express our support. Then you could do what you want, Mr. Manager, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. But we thought we, you should, we, we should let Absolutely. you know about this. Absolutely. Thank you. So on a motion by Mr. Byrne, seconded by, Me. who are you pointing at? Ms. Mr. Mahan? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? So that's a Lake Street location. Yes. Just want to make that clear. We, okay. We can work on the ownership question. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Wasn't there a third one? Was that one? No, there were two. Two in the first part, one, one <laughs> separate one. So that makes three total, but that's it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, next up, oh, discussion and approval for the revisions to the Selectman's Handbook. So really these are two, um, these are uh, two, two uh, revisions that, one is just, uh, if you notice on the introduction in board history, uh, we will have the board history for you at the next meeting. I was mentioning earlier that uh, I've been, we've gone through the town reports with Marie and, and Mary Ann and Ashley in the office helping out, and we have now listed every selectman that has served uh, since 1867 Wow! Uh, on this board. And uh, I need to correct history. We used to think that Frank Hurd was the first son elected to the Board of Selectmen whose father had also served which irked me because it made me the second. And actually, uh, there was a Charles Bailey who served, and then his son served 12 years later. <laughs> so there was, a, there was an original father and son before the Hurd or Greeley father and son. So, But I'm going to get my son to run, and then I think that'll be a string that won't, that hasn't <laughs> yet happened, possibly. <laughs> My daughter might be bad. Anyhow. I was going to so, say, we need, we need to start some daughter-daughter uh, yeah, yeah, follow yeah, ons No question. So under introduction of board history, you see they're highlighted in yellow. The handbook shall be periodically reviewed and updated as appropriate at the annual goal-setting workshop of the Board of Selectmen and Town Manager. Mr. Curry, you, that was something in particular you had wanted, yes. and we figured that's probably the best time and place to do Perfect. it. Perfect. And then the other change is related to... Um, uh, as you know, it irks me when people have warrant articles and we hold hearings and they don't show up for our hearing. And it's our responsibility to put a vote in front of town meeting. Town meeting votes on the recommendations of the Board of Selectmen, the school committee, uh, zoning, whatever else. So uh, that's now uh, down in the town meeting section. The only thing that's different is, the again, what's been highlighted in yellow there, which I'm sure you can each read. Uh, but we just want to clarify that our recommendation of no action isn't saying we don't think there should be any action. We're saying we were not afforded the opportunity to vet this and therefore come up with a vote. So I hope that's what that says to you all. So I can I have a motion? Move approval. Okay. Second. Second. Discussion? Very timely, Mr. Chair. 
<laughs> all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. It is our goal to have this handbook in front of you on the next meeting for your holiday reading pleasure to take with you and uh, bring home and then come back and we will vote on the, the, uh, the Selectman's Handbook at our first meeting in January. Now there's two major sections. There's the handbook and uh, then there is the uh, reference, what do we call workbook? Yeah, the reference material. Reference materials. So the, that, that's a much bigger volume, but that has the complete policies, all applications and the rest where the handbook would have a one or two page on each of our policies and procedures. So. Look, Bob and Nick are on the edge of their seat about that. Oh, oh. I'm tingling with excitement <laughs> because this has been quite a, this was an assignment I was given, what, five years ago, I think, at a goal setting meeting, so. G give it. Huh? <laughs> you make it sound like someone else gave it to you. <laughs> yeah. You said, not this year I'm going to do. <laughs> I think this said, year I'm going to do. said communication. I was napping. And yeah. I said, yeah, well, I'll, I'll do that one. Yeah. It, it is, it's five times the project I thought it would be, but we owe so much to, to uh, Mr. Byrne, to Doug, uh, to Eve from Adam's office. Um, you know, they, and they, they just have done so much work. Who? Marianne. Oh, Marianne from our own office who was you know, been the master of the, getting this all put pulled together. Anyhow, item number nine. So, uh, right? Mm. Oh, Mr. Paul. Oh, didn't we? I thought, I, I thought think we, we did. I made the motion. And okay, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Okay, sorry. So, uh, Mr. Mr. Dunn. Oh, this said you, Doug, instead of me under that. Should I have, was there anything else? I couldn't say it better myself, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> what else are we going to say? Kids are looking forward to a draft handbook under the Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Mr. Dunn, how about uh, the Minuteman Regional that. Agreement? <laughs> good. Uh, this has been, um, the pace has picked up. Um, I, and Minuteman has become, in every way, my second job. Uh, a week ago today, I was on the phone with a selectman from Lincoln, and uh, we made a breakthrough of sorts where we got to a set of terms that I felt like I could sell back to you and to town meeting, and that I could sell to the other 14 towns, Lincoln and Arlington being 15 and 16 in that mass. Uh, and so then, with uh, Adam uh, and Doug helped uh, with Doug help uh, writing a set of writing up the legalese of one of the one of these terms, and then Wednesday night we had a meeting of the 16 towns in Weston, of uh, 15 of which were there. Uh, Lancaster wasn't there, and over two and a half hours we hammered through most of the points, and so I left. I had hopes for Wednesday night with us walking out of that room with Elf. 16 towns saying yes this is a package that i can support and we walked out wednesday night with a lot of towns saying well i think i can support this uh, but there's parts of it that i'm not really psyched about it but if we're going to get it done this is the way and a couple towns kind of openly grumbling so uh then i and I, at this point i've, I've really kind of grabbed the wheel of this bus and like i'm doing the drafting and i'm doing the phone calls and i'm working with the superintendent and i'm like I describe it as I'm trying to drag this over the finish line. Uh, we haven't made it yet. So on Friday night, I sent out an email to all 16 towns saying, um, please take this to your respective boards and here are these three questions and please ask all three of your board, I mean all of your boards to vote on these three questions. So I'm doing, following my own instructions at the moment. Um, so I'm going to overview the three, and then I'm going to dive back into them in detail. One, can your board, in principle, support a revised regional agreement as drafted? I'm going to talk about that in a second. Two, um, can your board, uh, uh, oh, sorry, can you uh, uh, commit to calling a special town meeting by um, February 15th to approve the same? Conveniently, we have already done so. <coughs> Uh, and see, can your board decide promptly whether or not it is considering withdrawing from the district? So 
for me, for us, I think number two is a moot point because we already did, so it's easy, and we even and we put the regional agreement and bonding on the warrant. Um, can you decide decide promptly whether or not you want to leave? I don't think we want to leave, and I don't think anyone's talking about us wanting to leave. Certainly not in this time frame and in this particular process. So I think that those two um, are moot. But if anyone wishes to, you know, argue about them, let's do that because we should. All right. So going back to A. You don't need it on two. Yeah, let's I do it. Say, um, maybe on three, just to. I move that we uh, not take advantage of the option to discuss leaving the Minuteman district. We intend and announce our intention to stay in the Minuteman district. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Uh, uh, okay. Sorry. Was there any discussion? Mm -mm. Okay. So okay. Uh, yeah. So all right. Going back to number one. <laughs> going back to number one. Uh, can your board, in principle, support a revised regional agreement that is based on the 2014 uh, draft? So we, uh, we approved the <coughs> draft in 2014. Town meeting approved it. It had a number of changes related to capital, a number of changes related to governance. Um, it, it, like, it cleaned up a whole bunch of language. Like, so it's that draft as a base document. Um, in addition to that, it permits any town to withdraw. And the way that it would work is that a board like us sitting here would announce this month saying, we are considering leaving. And then that would put you on a list that's in the proposed regional agreement. And if you're on that list, then at your subsequent town meeting before February 15th, you would both vote to approve the regional agreement and you'd vote to withdraw or not. So there's some towns like Wayland who have taken, I think it's three votes already to withdraw from town meeting and we're making, and they're like, do we have to vote again? And I was like, yes, you do have to vote again. Um, but at the same time, Wayland's, you know, you, they're gonna wanna go. Boxborough, it's not clear. Sudbury probably wants to go. Weston probably wants to go. Dover probably wants to go. Carlisle probably wants to go. And so when we look at, uh, so when you look at, when we come back to our town meeting in January, the regional agreement is gonna say, here's the list of towns that might be departing and we're going to have to approve the regional agreement without knowing exactly who's in or who's out. I've been, um, I've been comfortable with that ambiguity because the towns that are leaving are all really small potatoes with the exception of Sudbury. Sudbury is a, like verging on substantive but you know Dover I think has one, uh, Weston I think has two, like there's just not you know like the, the, the for most of those towns the number of de departing if, is small. If, if, if we say tonight if we did vote leave would this blow up everything yes yeah it would shut things down quite nicely <laughs> <laughs> and actually that's really one of my worries is that one of the larger towns will be like you know hey we might as well take like a look this has been a big enough headache that maybe we'll just right and, and the thing is because for instance let's just say hypothetically let's talk about it being Belmont mm -hmm. if Belmont's oh, oh sorry I, I think a helpful point would be that um, in the agreement it says that the communities need to let you out through this vote but the commissioner of the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education would also need to let you out. Yeah. And I can't guarantee this, but I don't think that the commissioner would approve the exit of a community that would deep six the district. Yeah. I, if you agree. I, I agree. But I think that's a... Yeah. Dan, can I also add that yeah. that's the case right now? So that's not a change. Right. With respect to the DESE commissioner. Yes, DESE has final say in both yes. the old and the new agreement. Um, all right, so 2014, permits time to withdraw pays a host community consideration of $138,000 a year indexed to inflation to Lincoln. Lincoln has been a challenge in getting them to the finish line. And uh, if all in all, if like you just if, like, you know, take it or leave, like what would I be endorsing this particular provision? No, I do not think that it is, um, it is not necessarily a fair representation of what the costs are uh, in terms of what like the benefit that the, the cost of the, the services that Lincoln is going to be providing in terms of the payments that they're that they would receive under this Lincoln has done this for 40 plus years oh, excuse me Lexington has done this for 40 plus years they haven't received payments and they've been you know perfectly happy to support the school because the education is important to them I sincerely wish that Lincoln had the same attitude mm -hmm. but they don't and this is the cost of getting the building done. So the cost to Arlington of that 130 grand is on the order of 50 grand a year, which is um, more than offset by the, diff by the improvements that we get in the capital consideration. So if we get the new regional agreement and we build the school, the new regional agreement saves us somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 grand a year. So this is a little bit of a give and a take 
uh, to get it done. I'm not particularly proud of it, but if it gets the deal done, uh, and this is all about getting to yes, that's why I'm here, and I do endorse this. I do think we should support it. Um, last, t last term is that the regional agreement would uh, require all out-of-district students to pay not only their fair share of uh, operating costs, but also of capital. And so this one's a little bit nuanced because the, the way it works right now, if, you leave, if you're not in district, you don't have to pay capital. The state is saying under a new regulation that we're going to be able to permit to charge capital for a certain level uh, up to, uh, for, um, for any like school building approved projects. And what this is trying to say is that like even whatever the state says, we're gonna try to actually get the fair, full and fair share. And to give it some teeth, it was there, there's a sentiment that the people wanna force the school committee to not back out of this. And so that's where the two thirds weighted voting is. And so that if somebody, if uh, the school committee can you know, back out of this f fair share thing with a two thirds uh, weighted vote. So um, my motion for the purposes of, of discussion and with my full support is that we as a town um, are prepared to support a regional agreement based on 2014 uh, has the withdrawal provisions we talked about, has the host community payment that we discussed, and the out-of-district provision. Second. Discussion. Mrs. Lyon. I'm going to be totally guided by Mr. Dunn, where you've put a ridiculous amount of hours, months, years into this, starting with the term on the finance committee. I don't like the host community payment of $138,000 at all, but what far outweighs that for me is all the time and energy that you've put on into this committee, and I want to make sure that we all send you back um, with a strong unanimous vo voice um, from this board, um, A, in recognition that you're sort of steering this and guiding it and hopefully moving it along, but more so be your expertise. Um, I'm, I'm really, uh, that, that was one part, but I'm really guided by um, your recommendation, so I'm willing Thank you. to support it. I, will say, I really appreciate that because part of the reason we've been able to get the traction that we have is because I feel like I've been able to speak on behalf of the town, because, which I've done by <coughs> checking in with the manager and checking in with the finance committee and checking in with you. Uh, the communication, I believe, has been flowing back and forth, but that support, has, it's the only way I've been able to do it. And frankly, I'm concerned that not every town of the 16 has it, and that's what makes this such a trick. So the next meeting, puffed to chest out. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, well, there's one other tidbit I should add, uh, is that uh, Concord and Carlisle have both have had formal meetings since Friday even. Oh. <laughs> uh, Carlisle, uh, sorry, Concord and Lexington. And uh, they both, so Concord said, they both said they'd call the special town meeting and both of them had grave reservations about uh, the Lincoln provision. Mm -hmm. And Lexington in particular, I'm really, Lexington is looking at it and they're saying, you know, we've been doing this for 40 years because, right. for, for, right. because it's the right thing to do. and they're really riled up that, that Lincoln is not uh, on board that. Sorry, I've cut you off, Joe. No, that, that, that's fine. I, I think, um, not, you know, just to get on the bandwagon here, I mean, I think Dan almost downplays what, what he's done here and having pinch hit for you just one day and, and, and tangentially watch this process unfold. I mean, the people in these other communities know Dan, and, and, and I think it's really played to our advantage. I think we've all been involved in, in negotiations and public policy things. I don't think I've ever seen anything that has so many variables at play, though. And you seem to be able to hold them all in your head at once, which, uh, so thank you for that. Um, it feels like we're close, but, but I, re I recognize that, that, that Lincoln is uh, particularly um, intractable. Yeah. And how many students does Lincoln have on average in the school? Their average is really low, like two or three. Um, it's currently 11. Oh, it's currently 11. Which is like, a, there was much stunned awe at the table when that number came out. The, they are, um, uh, uh, you correct me if I'm wrong, they, they're also claiming impact of the building itself on the surrounding neighborhoods. I, I think that's part of what's what's uh, going on yeah. here. At least part of the argument that's been put forward. The proposed building would be the largest building in Lincoln. <coughs> Excuse me. And they've, um, 
they've gained precedent with other institutions on, on these types of impact payments. Do they have anything else planned for the property? Or is this the school like have school owns it free and clear like oh, okay. yeah they have owned gotcha. it si for, since inception since 1972 or whatever it is I didn't know if they were like playing a different development that would benefit the town more gotcha biting my tongue <laughs> fair enough thank you Dan no sir did, did you, uh, sorry I was just going to see if Adam uh, any thoughts too. So uh, I, I, very briefly, as Mr. Dunn said, uh, we, we've been in very constant contact throughout this. And you know, I've told Dan how impressed I've been with the effort he's put forth. And I think the real key is, so you, go, you, you turn the clock back five years, and Al Tosti and Brian Sullivan were highly involved in these discussions for a regional agreement, and there was a pause. So you turn it back three years, and, and I got highly involved with other town managers and administrators, and then Charlie Foskett put in a number of hours to try to negotiate this regional agreement. And, you know, the, the, in retrospect, I think what was happening was elected officials, selectmen from all of these communities weren't paying the attention they needed to pay. Now, with all of the communities looking and saying there could be a ballot question that will impose a building project and the debt associated with it soon, you know, within a couple of months, people have come to the table. And Dan has risen to that occasion as an elected representative of Arlington and said, hey, all you elected representatives, we got to put our heads together and we got to pay attention. And it has spoken to sort of the power of getting the attention of elected delegates from each of the 16 communities to come together. And Dan has really, you know, grabbed the bull by the horns and, and done a great job pulling it forward. We'll see. We're all praising Dan. We'll yeah. see, though. I mean, really, I mean, <laughs> no, I'll, be, I'll be happy to accept it when the deal is done. But yes. right, until it's still a long way from done. Thank you, Dan, very much. All those in favor of the motion by Dan, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. Correspondence Move received. Receipt. Move receipt. Move Is there a second? Second. Any further action on the? Um, in terms of the safety audit request um, at Appleton and Park, is this something that we send to the town manager to Officer uh, Rotel? I mean, yeah, what, what, why don't we do that? Yeah, I think that's reasonable. Okay, I'd, I'd like to make the motion on that, that we refer this to the town manager to the um, appropriate department in the APD. Okay. All right. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, new business. Uh, do we need, does the town manager need a vote on, on the last piece of correspondence? That's just, just FYI. Received. Thank you very much. Which we just did. Thank you. New business? New business. Mr. Hunt. Unfortunately, I do have one piece of new business. Um, we've received word from our uh, legislative delegation that we should expect Mass Housing to grant site approval on the Mugar property. Um, without receiving their uh, site approval letter, I can't say anything about what the substance of that would be, um, but uh, Mr. Witten, our special counsel, and I are, uh, will make sure we audit all of our options, but I think at this point it's safe to say that at the very least the most, one of the most important things we can do are make sure that the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Conservation Commission and other relevant boards that the uh, 40B application will be in front of now that site approval has been granted have the resources that they need to uh, properly examine, properly and fairly examine that application. Mr. Chaplain. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a few pieces of new business. Uh, first, on a sad note, I know the board is aware of this, but I want to make public comment in regards to the loss of town employee Scott Enright. A uh, young man uh, lost uh, a battle with terminal illness with cancer, uh, and the services are going to be held Thursday. Uh, so very, very sad to lose any, anybody who's a town employee, but certainly uh, to lose an, an employee really in the prime of their life is a, a tough loss. And I, um, you know, my, um, you know, my, my uh, heart goes out to the family, uh, and I'm sure the, the boys does as well. Uh, on, on a different note, I wanted to let the board know that just prior to the meeting tonight, I was able to go and uh, deliver some remarks to the Food Link annual meeting. Uh, the board might be familiar with Food Link from <coughs> their appearance before the board last year as a CDBG applicant. Uh, they're really a blossoming organization. I had the opportunity a couple weeks ago to volunteer for a couple hours in the morning and observe how they do uh, their business, and they, they, they really amazed me. Uh, they go to the Whole Foods in Medford, Whole Foods in Arlington, Panera, uh, and. Um, Panera, I believe, in Lexington, 
uh, as well as a, a few other locations, and they just have this masterful system of collecting food that would otherwise just be going to a dumpster, and they've got a whole plan to get it over to uh, the Boys and Girls Club, to the Thompson School, to the Senior Center, to the Housing Authority, uh, and, and it really and to the food pantry. They actually they they they're base of locations in the food pantry and they supply the food pantry um, and until just a month ago they were all volunteer and now through grants they have a part-time operations manager it's just an amazing program and you know I was very gratified that they asked me to come say a few words to their annual meeting um, also uh, <coughs> through through uh, Mr. Curo's efforts uh, attending um, a meeting of the uh, the 33 L R NAV uh, the uh, the Logan runway issue that this board has deliberated on a number of times and has sent letters um, to the FAA in regards to that. Uh, I've been asked as the town manager to sign on to a letter of all the communities that are affected to, to go to Logan Airport to Tom Glenn, the CEO of Massport, uh, asking for help and to get on board with, uh, with the issues that are being faced. And I think Mr. Kier will probably add a little bit more to that, to that uh, topic um, for the meeting he attended. Um, also want to mention that uh, the MAPC has asked me on Wednesday as part of a contingent as well to go into the uh, MBTA's Fiscal Management and Control Board's meeting to advocate for uh, keeping the Green Line Extension project uh, on track, no pun intended. Uh, there's apparently been rumor that the whole project is going to be considered being scrapped. Uh, and <coughs> Arlington's, uh, you know, through TAC and other groups have long been a supporter of getting that Green Line out to Route 16 because really a large number of Arlington residents would be served by that living within a half a mile as well as a large number of Arlington low-income residents that are that are underserved would be served by that uh, so I'll be going in to deliver remarks to ask them to not uh, you know not scrap that project and keep it keep it in, in line and finally uh, today Governor Baker rolled out a municipal modernization bill uh, that is being lauded as the most comprehensive piece of municipal reform uh, ever released. Uh, any of its individual parts are, 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 are nothing incredible or major, but it has just a number of, of small and, and, and significant improvements to the way we do business as local government. So it'll be interesting to see how uh, it moves forward to the legislature. Um, I think that the one of note that the board would probably be most interested in is taking off the state imposed cap on liquor licenses so that when the board and the town would like to <clears throat> consider increasing the number of liquor licenses issued, you wouldn't need to go through a special act of the legislature to be able to do that on your own um, through, through the board's, uh, board's, uh, board's own action. So uh, more to come on that, but I think it's just a continued statement of partnership from the current governor's administration in terms of working with local government. And I think that that's uh, all I have. Thank you. Mr. Byrne. No new business, Mr. Chair. Um, besides a great Thanksgiving Day game, <laughs> series is split 4-4, Arlington Catholic, Arlington High School. Uh, trophy's been renamed the Bob Jarabo Memorial Thanksgiving Day Trophy. Um, so thanks to Paul Cahill and others doing that. I'm actually probably going to see if Mr. Carroll will speak to a different facet of it. Um, we did have the first meeting of the uh, school enrollment task force. Um, it was agreed upon that the town manager would be the chair. Um, and God bless him, if, because everybody we have assembled around the table from our colleagues on the school committee, capital, planning, finance, et cetera, um, it was a very efficiently run meeting. Um, lots of things were discussed as well as we got a lot of public input, but I, I'll take it uh, the way the committee has conducted itself, at least at this first meeting. The next one is December 9th and then December 22nd. Um, a lot of the people who did get up, um, um, basically said you've already covered what I had to say a few of them had extra things and I, I took the fact that you know I had anticipated everybody in the audience would be getting up but I think it really spoke to the way uh, what was discussed how it was conducted and how we're moving forward in the future and I just want to thank the manager for doing that it was something that I wanted to make sure somehow it didn't fall to anyone else besides he so thank you for that and I'm sure Joe will probably have more I was 20 minutes late so he might have more to add and that's it thanks so, Mr. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm going to uh, then add a little bit of extra info on, on both things that Ms. Mahan and, and the manager have raised. Uh, on the school enrollment task force, um, yes, it was, a, it was an excellent discussion, and I agree the manager uh, ran it um, extremely well. Uh, this is going to be a difficult uh, slog. I think that the, um, the, the tenor of the initial discussions was around trying to uh, define uh, first a short-term solution 
to um, some of the pressures at Thompson. And there are a couple of options there, ranging from uh, temporary portables, por uh, permanent portables, permanent construction there, each with different costs and timelines, which we're looking for more information about at the next um, meeting to, to try to gain a little bit of breathing room for a more comprehensive solution for the, the school enrollment challenges, which are impacting um, uh, most of the elementary schools as well as the, uh, the middle school in particular, which was uh, noted. Um, one thing that um, I, I'm hoping we're going to discuss uh, this week, uh, this Wednesday, is um, the chair of the um, school committee's community relations uh, subcommittee did get up and mention that she had booked town hall for um, uh, January 7th for a public visioning session around this, so around the, the school concerns <coughs> and, and, and quite frankly the related community concerns also um, with, with this issue. Um, she has uh, engaged um, Stacy Smith, who's a professional, uh, works for the Consensus Building Institute, has done work for, um, I believe, for the master plan, Adam, is that? Uh, She's worked facility? on a number of issues, including the master including plan. Including the master yeah. plan. She's an Arlington resident and has offered her time for this, to run, run this, and I, I think that we'll be, we'll be the uh, um, Community Relations Subcommittee will be asking the School Enrollment Task Force to actively co-sponsor this visioning session. So it's something that I think might be of interest to other board members as well and others in, in the community. I, I'm not sure what time that's at, but I, I assume it's sure. like probably seven. Oh, yes, seven. We, we're gonna sure. have to confirm that, but I know it's January 7th. Um, so we're looking forward to further discussions um, on uh, Wednesday and the 22nd. Um, as far as the air noise um, discussions go, I did travel to Milton last week. There was a major um, meeting concerning this, this topic that was uh, assembled by Congressman Lynch and State Senator Joyce. Congresswoman um, uh, Clark and Congressman Capuano were also there. They managed, this is, I think this is really the first time that they had managed to um, pull together some of the top um, regional FAA officials, the Deputy uh, Regional Administrator for the FAA, as well as some of the top mass port official, there were hundreds of people in this auditorium. Obviously the, the South Shore gets hit by this problem also, as East Arlington and Belmont and Watertown and Somerville, our neighbors get hit. Some of you probably saw the Globe mm -hmm. article last week that Arlington's number two in the number of complaints that, that this year. Number two in the number of complaints, I think after Milton, which is, is uh, quite uh, rattled by this. Uh, Congresswoman Clark and uh, Congressman um, Lynch uh, are both um, leaders in, in the uh, Quiet Skies Coalition uh, within um, the, the Congress. And, and I think um, that really the, the FAA and the Massport heard the message really loud and clear that they have to find a way to equitably uh, spread the burdens um, of the, the air traffic um, uh, routes. Uh, you know, this, this, Boston's one of the the first cities to come online with, with this system, but there are a lot of other cities that are gonna be looking at us and how, how this uh, goes. And I know that we've all gotten calls and, and uh, emails about this and, and um, East Arlington's been impacted. So I'm, I'm really happy that the, the manager is signing on to this letter on behalf of the town. I think it's, uh, it's timely uh, to follow up quickly uh, on, on, on that meeting. Mr. Ciano, who's our representative to the um, the uh, Community Advisory Committee uh, to, to represent us on these issues. He said that he was at the it, meeting began at seven. He said he left at 10 and it was still going. Um, so uh, <coughs> people me. heard it loud and clear. And lastly, I just want to report that earlier this evening, um, I, I was asked to, um, you may recall that uh, earlier in the year we approved a public art project in memory of a young uh, Arlington High School um, a girl who had, had passed away and her parents had graciously endowed a public art project, a banner project to incorporate artwork from Arlington High School, Arlington Catholic, Minuteman, um, and, and uh, I was invited to serve on the jury. And we, we um, met earlier this evening at Arlington High School and we did choose the, um, the 30 uh, banners that will be part of that, that, that project. And let me say, they're, they're phenomenal. I think the target is uh, April for them to be equally distributed, 10, 10, and 10 in the Heights Center and, and, and the, the East. Uh, Mr. Ardito um, kind of headed up the initiative, so uh, that's all I have to report. Thank you. Thank you. All Minuteman, all the time.
Thank you for that. Nothing else? Mm -mm. So um, we've had quite a meeting. Um, the first light celebration, I think, went very well uh, this past weekend, the uh, lighting of the tree on Friday night. There was quite a crowd there. I really was uh, impressed. And um, Santa Claus riding around town on the free trolley. <coughs> Remind residents that uh, that there is free parking in the Russell lot, common lot, on Saturdays uh, to um, uh, encourage people to please vote. I mean, uh, shop local. Uh, this holiday, vote, vote local too. Vote local. <laughs> yeah, vote local and national uh, this holiday season. So uh, w uh, the next meeting of the Board of Selectmen will be at 6 p.m. On December 21st. Motion to adjourn. to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you. Amen.